we'll start with my uh, script for our remotely conducted open meeting. As a preliminary matter, this is Len Carden, chair of the Arlington School Committee. Uh, and uh, this is the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, May 28th at 6.30, well, 6.33. Um, permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Uh, members, please, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Hayner. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Schuchman. In the affirmative. And Ms. Morgan. Yes. And myself, Len Carden. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Dr. Bodie. I'm here. Great. Uh, Dr. McNeil. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Mr. Mason. Here. Ms. Elmer. Here. Uh, and joining us from the AA tonight is Juliana Keys. Welcome, Juliana. Hi. Thank you. And uh, I don't think we have any anticipated speakers other than uh, Ms. Elmer and other staff. So good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. This order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference. Uh, so for those of you who are on the webinar panel, please be aware that other folks can see you and take care not to share your screen um, uh, unless there's something you intend to share with, with our audience. Uh, and anything you broadcast will be captured by the recording. The, the, the meeting materials are available through the Novus Agenda dashboard and uh, ground rules for the meeting. Um, I will introduce each speaker and then I will go through the list of members as we have in other meetings to ask questions, provide comments or motions. Uh, please mute your computer when you're not speaking and please speak clearly uh, so that everyone can hear you. Um, and that's it, great. Oh yes, and each vote will be taken by roll call. All right, so for public comment, um, uh, unless there are any last minute additions, Karen, uh, we only received one public comment by email. Um, that was from uh, David Levy, and uh, he had a question. In preparation for the potential remote learning in the fall, how is the district planning to address the inequities experienced this spring that prevented full-scale remote learning from taking place? Um, I did already respond to uh, Mr. Levy that, uh, you know, we, we can't address issues that aren't specifically on the agenda. Um, I do anticipate that we will be addressing fall planning uh, in one of our, in our, probably both of our June meetings. Um, and uh, we can uh, ask the administration to address that question at that time. And Karen, and there's no other public participation, is that right? That's correct. Thank you. All right, so our first item is the update on uh, the COVID-19 uh, impact on our school district and the, the remote learning plan um, that's currently in place. Uh, Dr. Bodhi, do you wanna start with? I will, I'll, I'll start with, we have a number of um, things that we want to mention in this time. Uh, just sort of an overview and um, what's happening with respect to participation in the remote learning plan. 
Um, we want to also respond to the motion made by Ms. Morgan last time about, and, and Mr. Thielman, I believe, um, about uh, synchronous learning and what we can learn from pilots in the district. Ms. Dr. McNeil will speak to that. I want to talk a little bit about the elementary forum, what were some of the themes, um, and uh, talk a little bit also about the surveys that we're planning to conduct which will give us even more insight into what we need to do for next year. And I will talk a little bit about that at, at the end of this, uh, because that seems to be one of the questions that has come up the most, well, almost the most frequently in our elementary parent forum and as well as our secondary parent forum. So as we now are almost halfway through the uh, phase three that began May 4th. We're really getting close to that point. Uh, things are, are really moving in, a, in a quite a very good rhythm. And I think that that is what has been reported from uh, elementary principals, curriculum leaders and secondary as well. Um, what we're seeing is some interesting trends, which are something that will be part of the data that we use as we, as we think about next year. Um, and that is the difference between elementary and secondary with regard to two uh, important parts of the remote plan. So as we moved into this last, the third phase of the school closure, we changed uh, what we were doing with the cur curriculum and we also changed uh, accountability for the work that was done. Uh, at the secondary levels reported last time, there was um, the secondary, at both Gibbs and Otteson, students at the end of this time will have one of uh, three designations as to their level of participation. And at the high school, that will be around whether they um, audit the course successfully. So what we're finding in, in a broad picture is that at the elementary level, the participation uh, for the hangout meetings is higher than it is for turning in assignments. And that's even markedly different, be, a little bit different between the K-2 and the 3-5. And we talked a little bit about this today in elementary uh, principal meeting. So for example, in terms of turning in assignments broadly across the district, K-2, uh, roughly about 65% of the students do. Um, and that was whether they partially turned it in or completely turned it in. The participation rate, however, in Google Hangout Meets is about 89%. Uh, for grades three to five, the turn-in rate is even higher, that's 74%, and the participation in Google Hangouts is about 84%. Uh, the principals, uh, hypothesize that one of the reasons why the assignments turn in at the earlier grades is lower is that it involves so much more parent support to do that. Uh, parents have to take pictures of assignments or help them uh, you know, work with a Google uh, Doc or um, it's certainly just even any access to the, um, the platform. So that's very that's very interesting uh information as we think of one of our uh, three possibilities for the fall at the grades three through five however there's a market increase in that number and that i think is attributed to the students at those grade levels are a lot more independent in in uh, being able to work in the in the platform and prior to closure many of the students, particularly in grades four and five, already had experience with Google Classroom. When you get to the secondary level, and this is true sort of uniformly between uh, the middle school levels and the high school, and that is the turn-in rate is much greater than the participation in Google Hangouts, which for the most part is fairly universal through the in entire district at this point. So for example, at the middle school, and this is Addison and Gibbs combined, uh, the turn-in percentage is around 74%, and the participation in Google uh, Hangouts is about 23%. And that actually varies a little bit by grade level, so these are just broad strokes. So 
I can, I can put more of this data into a chart, though I'm still collecting it, uh, that you can have probably next week. But I just wanted tonight to be able to give you some broad themes that we're seeing. At the high school, um, it's sort of, it's fairly similar. Um, the turn-in rate is 73%, and the uh, participation rate in Hangouts is about 40%. So we're seeing just, just the reverse in terms of elementary and the, and the high school. Now, I think that uh, it, one uh, department actually gave me a comparison, and I could get this for the other ones as well, um, is what is the difference in the turn-in rate at the high school compared to the phase before this as to the, to the phase we're in? And it's a marked increase. It went from turning in enrichment work from about 58% um, overall to about uh, 74%. So it, there's a, we're seeing the effects in phase four of the, um, the fact that the assignments are now counting. And that sort of corresponds to the survey that we had taken that uh, student mo motivation and, not have, and having the assignments be optional did affect um, what assignments were turned in. So that's where, we, that's where we are right now in terms of like the overview. But I will tell you this also, because this is, I know, a concern of, of all of ours, is what is happening with the students who um, are not turning in or are not participating in some respect. And having talked to all the principals on this issue, those students are being um, identified. They reach out to them. It's reach out to them to their parents. And actually, uh, what we're finding at the elementary is that the numbers are not great. There, there's some level of participation fairly uniformly. And, and as, I, as I said, the, there's a there's definitely a reach out to parents and to the person who asked that question. It's certainly data that we're going to be looking at for next year in, in, one of, in terms of what, what will happen in the fall and, and how we can um, increase the contact of students with the district in terms of work. Of course, one of the options for next year is we're back full at our regular kind of schedule. So that is sort of a quick overview, um, but I think you're gonna learn more about how this is working. So I'm gonna ask Dr. McNeil to talk a little bit about the study groups that we have set up, an elementary study group and a secondary study group that um, are teachers who have volunteered, who are very interested in and have already been doing, in many cases, synchronous teaching uh, during this phase. So, um, we're learning a lot from this group, and I think we will continue to as we, as they continue to meet um, as a um, as a cohort. So, Dr. McNeil, do you want to talk a little bit about this because this this speaks to the motion uh, of the last meeting? Yes, thank you, Dr. Bodie. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, pursuant to the motion, um, I've I've worked with curriculum leaders and elementary principals to identify teachers who would want to be part of a pilot to pilot live direct synchronous instruction with the purpose of moving the curriculum forward so teaching key understanding understandings and supporting lessons um, and that is a distinct difference uh, from the goal of the way that we're utilizing live direct synchronous contact with students um, currently is that we're um, trying to use it to maintain contact, build community, and um, check on the social and emotional well-being of students. So I did want to point that out, that there's going, that, that was the purpose of forming the study groups and relating to the um, motion that was passed by the school committee. So I put together some action steps. So after I um, uh, contacted or spoke with the curriculum leaders and the elementary principals to identify teachers, I, um, they submitted their names on a spreadsheet so that I can see that, you know, what are the different grade levels and er content areas that are being represented at both the elementary and the secondary level. So uh, once I got the names, the names were submitted, 
um, and I created a document um, that had various guiding questions on so that could frame our conversations. So then we uh, identified a meet time. And so this, this past week, we had our first meeting. And what I found out in both of those study groups is that uh, to Dr. what Dr. Bodhi just alluded to, that we have teachers that have already been um, piloting different strategies, utilizing different online resources uh, for the purpose of teaching, uh, you know, academic content. And so it was, uh, it was very informative. Uh, teachers were able to identify the challenges and also speak about the successes that they were having. And then they were able to share best practice. So our goal is to identify an instructional model uh, that we can uh, implement in the fall uh, that will um, address the live synchronous with the goal of uh, conducting live synchronous direct instruction. And so we, the, the various things that we're going to focus on is expectations of students, uh, sharing best practice, and identifying guidelines that we can share with teachers uh, so that they can take these things in consideration as they do their lesson planning and also to identify the tools, the technology tools that we can utilize to, to support teachers in their lesson planning. So it was very informative. Um, at the elementary level, we have all grades represented. We also have special educators. Uh, we have a speech teacher. And then at the secondary level, again, all content areas are represented. And uh, the, each uh, level, the middle school and the high school are both represented as well. So we've done a lot of uh, discussion, and now uh, teachers are going to go out, the teachers who have not been doing it, um, um, we're gonna continue to talk about the things that they can do in order to pilot, pilot these strategies uh, in the remaining weeks of the school year. So I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Bodhi. Okay, um, maybe we should go take some questions at this okay, point. Before we go on, okay. Because uh, that's covered two different areas. Um, so we'll start in, and go in order, Mr. Hainer. Uh, one, one question I have, no, <clears throat> excuse me. Normally at this time, we would be doing testing, assessing where the students are prior to COVID. What do we, the secondary level has a permanent record for each student. Are we getting, uh, are the students getting a buy for this or are we going to be entering grades of some sort for the students at the end of this year. How is that going? Well, we are not, we are not going to be putting in grades for this last quarter or trimester, depending which it is. They certainly, the grades that existed before we um, went out into closure, those grades exist. Um, so what will the permanent record look like? Would it, would it, would it be an adjustment of those three quarters? Well, it depends on the particular level. Um, with the high school, what that will look like, first of all, in power school, um, you can see which assignments um, a student has turned in. That doesn't change, that, that portal look is there. What will, what will happen for high school students is that on their transcript and in the permanent record, um, they will have a record of which courses they audited during this time period and received an audit designation. They have, their grade for the year has been determined by the work they did prior to closure. Thank you. Okay, at the middle school, the same thing, the grade was determined by, by the work prior to closure and now they're getting a, a participation, um, partial participation and a, a did not participate a designation. At the elementary, there everybody's keeping track of the records. Okay, I'm I'm concerned more for the secondary uh, grade six or seven up because that's where the permanent record is, and I just want to make sure that, that there's not going to be a hole there. There'll be something there going forward. Absolutely, there'll be something Thank there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, this is very helpful. Uh, I had a few questions. Dr. Bodie, when you talk about that um, students are turning in, high, in work at the high school, 73% of them are turning stuff in, is that students who said they would audit the course? 
or is that all students? Um, well, that's a good question. My understanding is that it is the students that register to do it as an audit. So, so of their class, a certain, not everybody signed up to audit. In fact, some of them have in the column the not the non-audit percentage of students that are choosing not to do it. Um, but the student, but they are, these are the students, this is the percent that are choosing to audit the class and are turning in the work. Okay. And the students who, what is the percentage of students who said they would audit classes? I think it's pretty much the same as the percentage that we're getting for the turning in of the work. Um, I don't, I don't, that hasn't been parsed that thinly. I can look back and find that out. In other words, what you're asking is if there was a class of 30 students and 25 of them said they're going to audit, mm -hmm. what percentage of those are actually going to complete the audit? No, no. I said, what I was trying to find out is of your class of 30 students, what percent said they would audit? Mm -hmm. And then you said that the 73% that were turning in, that's of the students who said they were auditing. I believe it's the, the percent of the whole, but I'll, do I'll double check that. Okay. I think that's an important, really yeah. important question, right? Um, so yeah, I'd really like to know that. Yep, I will get that clarified. And when I put it, some of this in a chart so you can see it, I'll, I'll be still getting more data. And some of these percents may vary depending on the data I get, but um, let, me, let me clarify that. Okay. okay. Um, the second is just how, I, I appreciate what you're doing in terms of forming study groups and stuff, but I'm also wondering what we're doing in terms of reaching out to teachers and finding out what are the roadblocks for them in terms of doing um, live direct synchronous uh, contact. So if, if, I, can com if yeah. I can comment on that, um, you know, I can't speak to the individual uh, reports that parents are, uh, you know, saying that they're not contacting or connecting with their teachers. I can just speak from my experience with teach with speaking with uh, principals and teachers. And the majority of our teachers are reaching out to students. And, and, and like I like I made the distinct, I distinguish between the focus for the live direct synchronous contact right now is to you know, uh, connect with students, build community, check mm -hmm. on their social emotional well-being. For the purposes of the study group is to move, is to think about live direct instruction with moving the content forward. So, you know, in my dealings, in my uh, conversations with the teachers, the majority of the teachers I speak with, the principals that are checking in with their teachers, the majority of our teachers are reaching out to students and connecting with uh, students multiple times a week so you know I, I don't know about those isolated cases and I can turn that back over to Dr. Bodie. Well uh, if I understand the question a little bit is also about what are the impediments that they're finding right now that makes it hard for synchronous? Yes. Um, there are a number of things well one is just your own internet connection um, and you know, if you're here in Arlington or nearby, it's probably stronger, but maybe not necessarily. Um, whether they have ch children at home themselves, what, what the caregiving is. Um, also, what they're finding is that it's just um, students have in that kind of remote learning environment, what we've been hearing is that, you know, you, you can't go very long. Um, 30 minutes, as I heard from one principal today, said that the length of time you can hold the attention of a young young elementary student. So the and then there's just the management of a large group. Um, one of the things that we've heard repeatedly is that when the children are younger, uh, it is very hard to have a whole class together uh, because of just the management on the platform. Though I will say, and everyone would agree on this, they are getting much more adept at this as we go along. Um, their skills in remote platforming and the skills of teachers um, in, in also doing instruction and actually working in that kind of platform with all students is improving. 
So what we want to be able to capture during this time, and we're going to be doing that by surveys, is understanding more about that. Because if next year, uh, there are, and it's a good time maybe just mention, there are really three basic models we could be facing next year. One is just returning to school as normal. I'm not sure that highly, highly likely, but if we were in an entire remote or if we're in a hybrid model, and we're planning for all of these, what we're learning now is going to be very helpful. I think everybody understands that if we are in a remote learning environment next year, starting school, that, and by the way, nobody wants that. Everybody wants to come back to school. Um, that we would have to learn from this so that we have um, a different, probably a different schedule to what we're doing. In fact, probably a definitely a different schedule, much more synchronous um, teaching, but then learning what, what is an appropriate length of time for that as well. It's gonna affect so many aspects of this. So we're learning and um, I think that what we can uh, promise to give you is a little bit more insight into a lot of this over the next two meetings as we plan because we're trying to set like a constant input of data as we uh, are thinking about next year. Uh, is that more what you were thinking about is uh, some of the impediments? Yeah, I'm trying to understand and it's just, it would be really helpful to understand how many teachers have significant impediments towards um, live direct synchronous learning. Um, right. And um, and also somewhat the nature. I'm not trying to find out for any individual teacher, but just so that I understand what to advocate for in terms of helping make this go forward. You know, because internet internet is something that we can look into, or, or you know, we can ask the legis our legislate our legislature to look into. Um, children at home, it's more difficult, but it's just, it would be helpful to understand what some of the natures of roadblocks are. Oh, oh, we've already surveyed staff uh, earlier, and we'll probably use some of the same questions in the next survey just to get the comparisons. But I think that you're right. I think those are the kinds of things we need to find out uh, because in a, in a different remote environment or a, a more expanded one next year, we need to know that. We absolutely do need to know it in order to have a successful program. Okay. Would it, would it be helpful if I can share one question that keeps coming up amongst teachers? I don't, I don't know. Um, but one thing that keeps coming up is when teachers are talking or looking at this, like scheduling this in the fall, um, to answer your, your question, is that they're concerned about the teachers who have children at home and their children are on a different schedule like if we have to go back to a hybrid type situation and they have a staggered, we have a staggered schedule and they have to report, but their kids are in a different district and they are not reporting that day. So that's the kind of things that are, we're discussing and those are the kind of things that we have to plan for. So I don't know if that helps to answer your question. It would be one of the things that we'd wanna know about. Yeah. And, and also how many people fall into those categories. Mm -hmm. Well, child care is an issue for all parents who are at home trying to work. Um, and one of the things we want to find out from students in the survey we're going to do is how many of them are caring for children at home during the day while the parents work. So we're only going to survey from 6 to 12, but I think it will give us a good window into some of the information we need to have. And, and Dr. Allison Ampey, to answer your question of how we're getting that information, I know um, Mr. Spiegel's not here, so he's not speaking that, but he's he's going to be going to building meetings, uh, de department meetings and school building meetings to have that conversation around some of those HR, what we would put under an HR umbrella, um, concerns such as that. So that's one way that we're also gathering that information as well as principals having um, listening sessions. So not so much having more open-ended guiding questions so that the staff at their staff meetings can um, surface some of these concerns that have been floating around and that we have a way to capture those concerns in addition to like, you know, survey answers of a drop-down menu, you know, um, multiple choice. So I know the high school is planning on doing that 
uh, next week and the other level principals were talking about how they're going to do that in their remaining time as well. And I could add to that. I've Ooh. also gone to uh, uh, and spoken at the, and visited department meetings and met with teachers and along with the study group. So I was able to gather information from that process as well. Great. Ms. I think Keith, you had something to add. Something? Yes. I can just tell you a few things that we've been hearing throughout the district. Um, one is just technology capability. Um, the MacBooks are dying quickly. I know two people who have had them crash in the past week, they just the hard drives give out. Um, and it's the Chromebooks aren't really good for doing both virtual conferencing and presenting. So I can run a Google meet, but if I then try to share my screen and do something during that Google Meet, it just, it doesn't have the processing speed to keep up with that and everything lags. So that's one issue with doing synchronous instruction. Um, another is that it's just hard for timing with our families. A lot of these kids are like, oh, I was gonna come, but that's when my karate class was or something like that. So just scheduling wise, it's been really challenging. Um, we don't get full participation from the kids, which is hard and more and more and more the kids who are showing up pop in and turn, they don't have their cameras on, they don't have their microphones on. So you're kind of talking to a blank screen and it gets really challenging. I mean, I've been running mine as current events discussions and trying to talk about racism in America when you're just looking at a bunch of initials on a screen and you can't get any sort of facial recognition feedback from kids is really hard. So I think going forward, looking at like set student expectations for what these virtual classes would look like, making sure we have the technology to run them, making sure we have a set schedule throughout the district. Those are some of the things in addition to, you know, finding ways for teachers who have other things going on in their household to have a space where they can run them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ellison. Did you have more? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thielman, Ms. Seuss is not here, so you're not, you're up next. Um, I did, you know, Kersey uh, touched on a lot of the major points. I want to thank the district for um, attempting this. I think this was an important thing to, uh, to do. Uh, and uh, I ended up chatting uh, with uh, one of the science teachers in the high school who said that the participation in his particular class was pretty high. Um, I don't know, 65, 70% of the kids participating. And so I think by doing this, we're getting good data and we're getting experience. I appreciate how difficult it is for people to teach and parent and uh, be at home, uh, even if they're not parenting, whatever they're doing, it's not an easy place to do their work. I do want to say one thing is that, you know, um, this looks like the only part of the meeting where I can make this point, but uh, I think we have to keep doing all that we're doing, uh, keep doing all sorts of experimentation. I think that most people, parents and others are, um, are tired and uh, it's, 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 it's worth kind of uh, moving our mindset to an idea that we have to try to do everything we possibly can to open up next year in school on site uh, with instruction and learning taking place on site. I, I think that the reality we face as we deal with COVID-19 is that we can't keep everybody, we can't make it perfect. We can never make it perfect in this environment. We're gonna have to live with some uncertainty. We're gonna have to respect parents' rights and, and families' rights to keep uh, kids home uh, should we open. And we're gonna have to accommodate for that. But I really think that the broad, uh, lots of parents, I can't speak for every parent, um, many, many parents, many, many people that I run into um, feel like um, our, our mindset at least has to be that we're gonna do everything we possibly can to open as safely as we possibly can, understanding we can't be perfect um, and there's some risk. So, uh, at, I guess you and I had exchanged about this today, so that's, I just wanted to make that point. Well, thanks. Yep, we want that yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, great. Mr. Schuchman? Terrific. Uh, in, in listening to Mr. Thielman, I just want to make sure that we also understand 
that along with the kids in the building, the adults are in the building as well. And uh, I don't know how many adults are in critical uh, cohorts uh, uh, for COVID infection uh, with the likelihood of bad outcomes, but that's got to be a consideration as well. We can't be risking the lives of our the adults who are working for us in the system, even if it might be safe for kids to come back. So it's 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 all about the entire community. Now, I was on a DESE uh, Zoom meeting with the uh, Advisory and Assistance uh, Council, um, and a couple of interesting things were popping up there. And what the state is hearing is there's some kids who are absolutely thriving under what we're doing right now. Uh, that kids who were not doing well in a traditional classroom setting were just doing okay by having to go to school in, in the morning and coming home in the afternoon are all of a sudden just thriving and, and, and performing at higher levels. Uh, the other thing is, is that the state is also reporting there are far more connections right now between teachers and, and, and families uh, than there were before. So. I know there are a lot of uh, a, a lot of deficiencies in what we're doing right now, but I also want to make sure we're capturing the the gems in what's going on right now and where things have happened beautifully uh, and unexpected positives coming out of this. So that when we're evaluating what we need to do going forward, we're doing so within the context of knowing what didn't work so well, and as well as the things that are uh, unexpectedly wonderful. Um, you make two very, very good points. Uh, one, I agree with you, we have to look very carefully at the staff, and that has to be a, a, a strong consideration to the safety of opening. Um, but to your point about GEMS, I think you really, uh, that's a really excellent point. In fact, today, that came up in the elementary principal meeting, and this came from a couple of schools that one of the things they're surprised to see, fifth grade teachers are surprised to see, is how the quality of writing has improved. Um, markedly so, so that they would comment on it. So I think that you're right. We need to capture some of the, some of the gems of learning that and who is thriving that may not have been thriving prior to this. Uh, so I think we have, we have those students and we also have obviously the students who aren't doing or, or not as participating and not learning as much. We also have families who said, we're doing it ourselves. Uh, that's okay, school, don't, you don't need to keep sending stuff. The other, the other thing I wanna point out is that the state is wondering what to do uh, going forward, because obviously you don't have a lot of data to do any, to accountability with for next year. And uh, I, my feeling, I think there, the, there was a predominant feeling in the group that the data that the, the state can assemble as to what's going on and who's doing well and who's struggling is important to have and share, not as a, an accountability tool per se, but a way to identify best practices and share, share outcomes. Um, uh, the, I know that we're working collaboratively with Winchester and Lexington and Belmont and Burlington and th this group of superintendents that, that helped move us forward at the beginning of this by being the first districts to uh, uh, suspend classes. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the role that the state has and the role that we have as a district is to be very frank as to what we think we're doing well and what we're struggling with. Because no one district alone has the resources to move forward and do wonderfully in all of this. And the more we learn from each other, the better. And just when you, uh, on a side note on the quality of the essays and the quality of the writing that's going on, I know from uh, Rieko teaching is that the quality of piano is going up because her students are practicing more as a result of the shutdown, that uh, kids are more focused on what they're doing. So 
there, there's there's some positives out there. Not that we want to live like this, but uh, uh, let, let's celebrate the good things that are happening as well. Great, thank you. Ms. Morgan, you're next. Um, so a couple of comments and then a question. So I, I also need this. I heard you say, Dr. Bodhi, that you would provide us this participation information in a chart, and that's great because I need to be able to look at it with my eyeballs. Um, I don't learn by hearing as well. Um, also, um, Dr. McNeil, I heard you say that the majority of um, students, of teachers are doing synchronous meets. Um, I mean, majority is like more than 50%, right? So that is that to me, I, and I know that it's more than 50% are, are meeting with students, but you know, uh, I, it, it's hard for me to feel like, you know, if we're aiming for the majority or even 70%, that still means that like 30, 20, you know, some number of teachers are not meeting with students at all. Um, and that continues to be the experience in our family. Um, so I know, you know, I, and I hear that from other people. So I, I hope that that is something that, you know, you can continue to work on. I, you know, I absolutely appreciate that there are internet connectivity issues and technology issues. Um, I just, you know, I, I don't really want to get to majority and say, well, we're at the majority, so that's okay. Um, my question is about, um, I'm, I'm kind of horrified by the 65% turn in of assignments in K through two. That is, is alarming <laughs> to me. I have a first grader. Um, and my question is, and I heard that you touched on this, Dr. Bodhi, when you said sort of dismissively that, oh, well, parents are saying we don't need you school. But, but what happens in September if we're still in a remote environment? And a lot of parents say, you know, we're not turning this stuff in anyway this isn't working for our kid or our family. And what happens if they, right now, if they just don't do it, it doesn't matter. But if they don't show up in September, if they opt to homeschool and our enrollment decreases, like, how, like how do we feel about that? Because I, I mean, that's something that I think, especially in these early grades is, is very real. And, um, and so I guess, I'm curious what our thoughts are about that. Um, are we concerned about what our, you know, I mean, a lot is a lot of our state aid is pegged to what our enrollment numbers look like and how many kids are sitting in their physical or remote seats on October 1. So has that been part of the conversation at all? Well, first of all, I don't want to, I, I, characterizing what I said is dismissive. I'm just saying that there are some parents that are doing their, their work at home and they want to do it that way right now. As far as the fall goes, I think that some of the questions you're asking are certainly ones that we have to uh, be concerned about because there are going to be students whose parents are not, if we're back in, in session, in either a full session or a hybrid session, are going to feel comfortable necessarily having their students, their children in the school. Um, that is going, th those are things that we're going to have to definitely look at. Um, I don't think I can give you a definitive answer is exactly what we're going to do because that is part of the planning process that we're engaging in uh, at this time. And, but it is certainly something that is on our list of considerations to think about for sure. Um, so my other, so I guess the other piece of my question is so I understand that we'll have challenges with students who potentially don't attend if we were are in the buildings. I am also concerned that given, especially in the early grades, the really low submission rates that we're seeing, that we could have parents that opt out of participation in a remote setting right that that we can have people that say you know i'm not going to do this anymore i don't want to do this i don't want to and even some of the people who are submitting saying i don't want to photograph my kids stuff and put it in google classroom this isn't a value add enough for my family massachusetts is really kind to homeschoolers and and what happens if we have some cohort and my guess is i i don't know anecdotally my sense is is that it would be in the early grades but but I worry about that even in a fully remote situation. 
You know, in a fully remote situation, one of the things we have to find out is whether the platform is one of the issues. Um, if you recall, Google Classroom was not something that our K through two students even knew about um, prior to the last few weeks. So that's part of it. And at Google Classroom, uh, many we've already started to, to change to another platform called Seesaw. And we may find is that we're going to see more, um, more participation there. But I will tell you one thing why I'm, I'm wondering whether the platform has a role in this is that we have another uh, a software program called Dreambox. And that, that, that particular software is more, um, creates more independence for students to access it than, um, than probably some other things that we use. So the independence of students to be able to um, access the work, respond, I think has the platform and the ease of the software plays a role in that. And that's something we have to look at. So we can speculate, but I'd certainly like to find out with the parent survey a little bit more about that piece of it. Um, I also think it's the time of the year. Um, we've gone through a very challenging time in our society. Uh, we're at the end of the school year, and yet, you know, we still have students that are, are, are participating. It's not the percentages we perhaps would want to have, but I think we have to put it in context where we, where we are right now. Um, but these are certainly issues that we're going to very carefully consider as we, we plan for next year. Let me be clear. I mean, we would like to be back in school next year. Nobody feels that this is a, is a, a good substitute for what goes on in the schools. It's just not. We're constantly adapting to try to make it better than what the limitations are of a remote learning environment. And there are limitations. There's certainly some gems, as Mr. Slickman said, there are. But all in all, I think that most people are finding, even those people who are working on Zoom all the time, are getting tired of not having that personal contact with people. So there are, it's hard to, to entirely say what is the, the main cause, but that's what we'll try to find out as best we possibly can. And I also would like to add on to that. When I say majority, I've checked in with curriculum leaders and I've checked in with principals about teachers making the synchronous live contact. So I do want to combat the narrative that comes in when we get the, uh, you know, perspective from parents that a lot, a lot of our teachers are participating and doing the things that we're asking them to do. And I just want to honor the work that they're doing because they are, you know, they're living this as well. And I just want to emphasize that I can't emphasize that enough, the appreciation I have for our teaching staff because of the things that they're dealing with and they're having their professional and their per personal lives merged together. So they're living this. I have three kids at home. You know, a lot of teachers have kids at home. They have other things that they're dealing with. So I do want to make sure that we honor the work that they're doing and we don't send out the narrative that they're not doing the best that they can do, whatever the situation they're dealing with. So they're doing the best that they can, can do. And if there's a reason that they're not reaching out, then there's a reason and that we have to find out what that reason is and address it and support them. Thank you. Ms. Morgan, did you have anything else? No, just thank you, Dr. Bodhi, for sharing this the information with us. I really, I appreciate the data and the specifics about submission and, um, and just your candor about, um, about where we're at. So thank you. Thanks. So my comment, so Dr. Bodhi, I think you're going to still talk a little bit about the surveys you're intending to do. Is that right? You're, you're on mute. Sorry, you're still on mute. The phone is ringing, so I wanted to yeah. unmute. Uh, mute. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, but also okay. about the summer plan. Okay, so let me let me just give my comments um, on, on what you've already discussed. So um, yes, the data is helpful. It's still a little bit confusing. So when we say like 65%, does that mean 35% aren't turning in any assignments or that just mean the average, you know, totaling all of, let's say there's, you know, 10 assignments in a week for each student, 
Um, so a thousand assignments across the school, only 65% are being turned in. That kind of, you know, more granular explanation of what that number means would be helpful. Um, and it would be helpful to get that, you know, data to us, you know, not in two weeks at our next meeting, but sometime before that. Um, I think that the purpose of our, you know, of our work over the next few weeks is to find out what is working, what's not working and why. So like Dr. McNeil said, we need to find the teachers that are not doing any synchronous learning or that have started or that did it and stopped it because it wasn't being successful and find out. I think a lot of a lot of the participation rate issue is that we're not teaching new curriculum. So unless you're interested in current events, why would you go to Ms. Keyes's session, right? Because it's not part of the assignments. So I think, um, uh, Julia, please. No, I, we are teaching new curriculum. We've been moving the curriculum forward since May 4th. In um, live sessions, so. No, but I think a lot of teachers are using their Google Meets, not necessarily for instruction, but for answering questions, previewing material, um, helping kids who might get stuck, clarifying. Um, it might not right. be direct right. teaching. So that's, that's, that's what I'm saying, though. I mean, that's part of, part of why the participation isn't so high. My daughter, for example, doesn't have questions, so she doesn't go to her Google Meet, or she says she doesn't have questions, you know. Uh, and I'm not gonna force her to go because it's not required, is she's not learning anything new other than hearing other students, you know, ask questions, which would which is help, a helpful exercise. But I, I don't want us I don't want us to misinterpret the data as saying live sessions aren't working because people aren't aren't doing them. So we don't do live sessions in the fall. I think there's a lot about the way we're doing live sessions that that first, they're not mandatory, so people aren't going. And second, they're not, by and large, they're not in introducing new material, so there's no reason to go. And also, the technology that we've provided our teachers to conduct these sessions is inadequate. So they're probably not very good sessions, um, you know, as far as, you know, you know I, I was talking to a teacher from Boston, and he had like a home studio set up um, uh, that they set him up with because you know, with a, with a camera for his whiteboard and a separate camera for him. And so certainly as we, we look to the next few weeks, we need to, to, as a district, figure out where we've been successful and where we're falling short. And I just don't want to in, miss the data misinterpreted as live lessons don't work, so we shouldn't be doing them. I think we need to find out more granularly why people aren't attending or why they are, you know, that science teacher that we have 65% at the high school, whatever he's getting. Let, let's find out what he's doing that he's getting people in that other people aren't. So I know you're all working on that, but that's just my comment that that's, that's what I'd wanna see over the next few weeks, the study groups that we formed. Let's get some teachers introducing new material and see if they can get higher attendance that way. Um, and, and as we move forward, and also talking to the other districts, like I said, you know, in, in Boston, they are providing you know, maybe this is just one school and one teacher, um, but in, but they are providing more robust technology for for home instruction, uh, and so let's find out what other districts are doing that you know so that we can know if we have to do this again what 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 we need to do. All right, so that's my comment on on that round, and and Dr. Bodie, you had some more to present. Um, I do, and I also want to just comment on what you said. Um, we are learning from this. I don't think that anyone is coming to the conclusion that because students aren't coming to hangout meets, that doesn't mean that synchronous learning could not happen. In fact, I think pretty much everyone understands that should that be what we're, we're gonna be next year, it's going to be a different kind of remote learning environment than we currently have. We wanna learn from what we're doing to make it even better. Um, as far as the technology, we are buying uh, all teachers a new computer. Um, that is happening because we've heard the same thing, that they really are um, inadequate in many cases for what they need to be able to do in that environment. And so that is happening. Um, in fact, I believe they've already been ordered. Um, so that, that will take place. It, and in general, technology is an area we have to look at in terms of equipment. And we are. We're looking at webcams. We're looking at these... Um, gooseneck um, things that you can hold cameras in. So we are looking at all of that, for sure. Um, 
I am cognizant that uh, we're over the time that you had in the, um, I can come back to this in the superintendent's report if you'd rather, because we have a speaker here this evening. I don't know if she has uh, some time constraints. That, that's your call, Mr. Cardin. Uh, sure, whatever, uh, Ms. Elmer, whatever you prefer. Sure, I, I mean, I, Dr. Orkin is here and I appreciate her coming um, tonight. So if we can, um, you know, this was a presentation that we had planned back in February before the closure. So this isn't specific to um, stuff uh, that we're doing as part of the closure. However, we have been working with Dr. Oregon through the closure. She'll speak a little bit about this, but this was a, a presentation we had planned early in the year. And unfortunately, Dr. Seuss is not here because I know this was something that she was actually really interested in. So um, I will turn it over to Dr. Orkin who has a presentation. So I think as a participant, you should be able to project your screen, right? If you can share your um, screen for the PowerPoint. Well, she's getting up. I, I will come back to all of these other points in the superintendent's time. And Dr. Orkin, are you unmuted? Okay. Hello. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Melissa Orkin, and I am going to be talking about um, a collaboration that um, I have been engaged in with the Arlington Public School System through um, a small consulting practice that I um, run called Crafting Minds. So I'm a developmental psychologist, which means that I um, try to understand different aspects of development and my specialty is in written language. So I focus on the development of reading skills and I in particular work with students who are struggling to learn to read and those who have been diagnosed with dyslexia. So um, our collaboration started in, whoop, did I freeze? Still working? Okay, can you hear me? Um, so our collaboration started in 2017, and um, at which time I had a conversation with Allison Elmer about um, the services that were in place in Arlington. And um, Allison felt like she was wanting to really um, diversify the options for students who were on IEPs for reading. So after a series of conversations, Allison and I established this goal to appropriately differentiate specialized instruction for those students who are on IEPs for reading. And since that time, we've offered nearly monthly um, professional development workshops um, so for school year 17, 18, 18, 19, and then 19, 20. And we've also conducted several school-based consultations. So that looks like going out to the schools and sitting with teams and talking about actual Arlington Public School students and applying the work that we've done in the workshops um, to cases. And I've also done some more limited casework. And I've had the opportunity to work with general education on um, a, a grant um, last year. So um, I'm going to talk about these different components um, of our work together. So appropriately differentiating specialized instruction for students on IEPs um, is a pretty tall task. And there are multiple components that you want to consider. So we are addressing the background knowledge and the training of um, educators in Arlington. We are looking at the assessment practices and interpretation. We are thinking about how we're planning instruction for students, and we're looking at how we're monitoring their progress. So once they're receiving instruction, um, how are they doing? Are they making adequate progress? Does it seem like the right plan for them? So I'm just gonna talk about each of these in turn. Um, so in terms of the background knowledge, um, as you may know, um, specific learning disabilities or SLDs in reading, including dyslexia, comprise the most common specific learning disabilities. Um, and yet, in general, in the United States, there's very limited coursework at the graduate level 
on the processes of learning to read and delivering specialized instruction. So that leads to just a wide variability in practitioners' background and knowledge about how to support students who are struggling in this area. So the first part of our collaboration really focused on how reading happens in the brain, like the complexity of the process. Um, and in particular, we looked at the way that different component skills lead to achievement in reading. So what I mean by this is when you think about reading achievement, you might think of a student sitting with a book, reading a narrative or an expository text and being able to answer questions or tell you about what they've read. But that's really like the highest level of reading ability. And in order to achieve that, there are all of these underlying processes and they fall into three categories. So there are all of the processes that lead to accuracy in reading, being able to recognize words correctly. Fluency, like having that process just be effortless for the student. And then comprehension, so being able to understand vocabulary and understand main idea and details and compare and contrast and to engage in inferential thinking and all of those great analytic tasks. And within each of these categories, there are lots of subcomponent skills. And so in our work on building kind of background knowledge among educators, we took these in turn, we looked at how they're developed, and we thought about how we might now measure them. So that brings us really to the next piece. Once you understand how reading happens in the brain, then you wanna think about, well, for a given student, how do I know where the breakdown might be happening? And that's where assessment becomes your key tool. So we looked at, we wanted to ensure that the assessments that are being used in Arlington measure these component skills. And then we wanted to support educators' ability to interpret students' performance on these assessments and plan instruction accordingly. And then we wanted to talk about, well, how are you gonna communicate now what you understand about this child to the rest of the team, to the family, to the gen ed teacher, to all of the stakeholders. So we started by conducting um, a district-wide needs assessment. So we sent out a survey in, I wanna say 2017, possibly 2018, where we um, wanted to really take the temperature of what was happening. What's happening from school to school in terms of the measures that are being used from practitioner to practitioner? How comfortable do um, practitioners feel with different measures? Do they understand what they're measuring? Do they understand how to administer them, how to score them, all that good stuff. And so that resulted in a set of recommendations that I'll talk about in a minute um, in, that would help round out the assessment battery. Um, and we also wanted to introduce a framework that would really um, structure interpretation, that would make it consistent from one practitioner to another, and that would make it manageable for families to understand the decision-making process. And we um, practiced this process with different case studies um, and applied it to Arlington Public School children through some school-based consults. So as I showed you before, reading is the result of all of these component skills. And when we looked at the results from the needs assessment, we found that this blue column was largely missing, that the, we just didn't have many measures that were assessing these skills. So we brought in um, some new assessments and we trained educators in these additional assessments, particularly to measure fluency skills. And here are the names of the assessments if you're interested. And, um, we also looked at phonological awareness skills, and um, we added some existing measures to the battery for any child who is suspected of a learning disability in reading. So traditionally, um, it wasn't the case that all children also had their oral language skills evaluated, and so we added that to the batteries, especially for an initial evaluation. And then we introduced a framework or what we call a graphic organizer for helping practitioners interpret the results. So the graphic organizer looks something like this. If you can imagine that this is the organizer for a student named Gabby. She's in third grade 
and you'll see that there are several like dark and shaded areas and they give us a sense of how she's performing in these various skills. So um, up at the top here, it says connected text in reading and reading fluency and comprehension. That would be like Gabby reading a passage or reading a story. So that gives us an idea of how she's achieving overall in reading and what she's understanding from what she's reading. But then these columns down here, accuracy, retrieval, or fluency in oral language comprehension, they answer the question why. Like why might Gabby be struggling in her reading achievement? And so it's pretty clear here that Gabby's performing um, below average in many of her accuracy measures. So it gives us the indication that what she needs is an approach that's gonna be targeted towards building her accuracy skills. Um, and so this really helps organize all of this data. Teachers get tons and tons of data out of eligibility testing. It's a huge investment of time and resources and really being able to sort through it and make it manageable to interpret and explain to families can be very helpful for a team. So moving on to instruction. Um, so reading, uh, specialized reading instruction um, is a field where there are just dozens of different curricula and not all programs are appropriate for every student. So our, our collaboration has been to ensure that a student's IEP goals and their objectives and the instructional approach match their needs, match what is revealed on that graphic organizer. So that allows the district to then invest in resources that are going to be reflective of what's needed in the student population. And so um, the district um, recently invested in a pretty broad decodable library. And those libraries are comprised of texts that, are with, that have controlled language. So for example, for a student like Gabby, who's really struggling with her accuracy with reading, a decodable book will allow her the opportunity to practice the skills that she's learning. So if she's just working with short vowel sounds, the teacher would choose texts that only have short vowel words in them. And that would be an opportunity for her to really build her skills in a, in a thoughtful and systematic way. And we also wanted to bring some recommendations into gen ed. So making sure that classroom teachers understood their students' profile and how they might accommodate and modify the grade level curriculum so that it's accessible to the student as well. So reading is one of the few areas um, of learning that is defined by law. So the process of reading has um, a federal definition and that definition has been heavily influenced by the National Reading Panel, which was um, a congressionally convened panel in 2000 that essentially defined the five essential components of reading instruction. So you see them here in red. So we know that reading instruction has to include these five components. And so we use those five components and we match them up with areas of weakness. So in green, that phonological ability, that's those accuracy skills. So if a student is weak in accuracy skills, they would have an IEP goal in phonemic awareness and or phonics. And if a student is weak in their retrieval, they would have a goal in fluency. So we're taking kind of federal guidelines and we're taking research practices and, and evaluation and we're bridging the two to make sure that what we're doing is data-driven and um, evidence-based. Um, so, so far we've held over 20 hours of workshops that have focused on developing IEP goals and objectives um, and um, helping practitioners choose a curricula that matches students' learning profiles. We've provided training in what's called a structured literacy approach, which is kind of the gold standard in the field and is just a series of activities that a teacher goes through with students to make sure that they understand how to build words from individual letters and sounds up to single words, up to sentences and passages, and then also have um, skills in spelling. Um, and then most recently in May and April, we um, had a series of five meetings with the, um, I think it was five, five or six, Allison, you'll have to correct me, but um, 
we had a series of weekly meetings where we were able to, I was able to collaborate with the um, special education staff and some reading specialists in helping them transfer all the wonderful instruction that they had been delivering in the classroom to delivering it remotely. Um, and so that was um, great and they were so impressive. They really took on this challenge, not only trying to master the technology as you've all been discussing as its own learning curve, but also really thinking about how to use different platforms to their advantage to, to engage students in new ways. So the final piece that we um, have been working on is progress monitoring. So you've done all of this work, you've assessed a child, you've developed an instructional plan, you have goals for them, you've chosen the curriculum. How do you know it's right? How do you know it's working? And there are, again, lots of different approaches for progress monitoring. It can be difficult to know what constitutes adequate progress. There's no gold standard. There's no one metric that we can use. Um, and sometimes because of these variabilities, um, it can lead to instructional decision making that might not be in the best interest of the child. So a teacher might think something is not working and change their approach very frequently because they're, they're trying to find the right thing. Or a teacher might persist with an approach even though it's not effective for a student. So what we've been doing is working to identify some progress monitoring tools that can be used consistently um, to plan for a progress monitoring meeting if they're not already in place. So that would be a set time every six to eight weeks that would occur um, when the teams, when grade level teams would convene and discuss the progress of students. And before that period, um, teachers would not make any changes, rather they would just collect multiple data points so that they can make um, an informed decision. Um, and we also wanted to offer some guidelines for measuring progress. So, so far we've identified some progress monitoring tools and we've provided training on the administration of them and here are two that we're working with. Um, and our ongoing work is really in using some of these validated metrics um, to make sure that we can measure adequate progress. And there, these are a couple of metrics that we're drawing from. Um, so in terms of next steps, our plan is um, to continue using the graphic organizer that you saw that we formally call a, a targeted intervention framework um, for the evaluation process. So for initial evaluations, for re-evals, um, and for instructional planning to continue with school-based consultations. So that means going into schools and working with teams and they would bring a graphic organizer that was filled out for a student and together we would you know, discuss the student and what their history has been and how they've been responding to instruction and what um, a plan could be for them. Um, and our hope is to, and we, we started this, um, this winter, our hope is to collect district-wide data on the students' needs across the district for those students who are on IEPs for reading. You know, how many students have weaknesses in accuracy versus fluency? Because those then indicate that different curricular approaches are needed. And so it would help with resource allocation planning to have a sense of the percentages across the district of students with these kind of different profiles. And, um, and the hope is to also bridge this work into general education. So um, I had the opportunity last year to work with each of the elementary schools um, to meet with the teams of first and second grade student, first and second grade teachers and reading specialists. And um, we engaged in similar work, this idea of differentiating instruction, figuring out what the needs of the students are and then grouping them homogeneously. And this dovetails really nicely with um, all of the um, energy around the early literacy screening, um, at which point you would be screening students, kindergartners first and maybe second graders for their risk of um, reading impairment. And then after you have all that data, the real work is in interpreting it and planning the appropriate instruction for students. So um, using that, using a similar framework that we're using in SPED can be helpful. So 
thank you so much for the time to, to present this and, and also thank you to Allison and all of the special educators that I've worked with in Arlington. It's been the longest collaboration that I've had um, as a consultant. Um, I started working with Allison just as I was leaving a position with a research group in, at Tufts. And um, it's been really gratifying to, to see all of the teachers, you know, transform practices or they've informed my work and it's just been um, an excellent experience for me. So I'm, I'm just so grateful. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so Mr. Hainer, you're, you're first. Please understand what I'm about to say is no way critical of what you presented. I think your program is phenomenal. I was a regular ed and special ed teacher. And uh, I think differential uh, experiences in the classroom are just phenomenal. But I don't see how this can be implemented with the possibility of us still teaching from home and remotely. Um, my biggest concern, all the things that you presented, the one area that I'm deeply concerned with special needs children is the socialization component that is usually in place in a lot of IEPs of interaction. And there's no way that those that part of the IEP is being dealt with right now. Uh, it's a very difficult part. So uh, I appreciate all your work. I appreciate all the stuff that's gone forward, but I don't see how this is going to be implemented uh, going forward. So uh, Mr. Hainer, to your question about how you would implement specific aspects of of this of what we've been doing or in general because part of the work that I know we mentioned it briefly we have been meeting um, over the last five to six weeks with um, special educators and reading specialists to explore how to do those assessments we mentioned um, dibbles and pass how to administer those um, in an online format how we can use tools like seesaw to actually um, design instruction that allows for us to get actual data from students around um, how they're practicing or implementing the skills. I think one of the things that we've been talking about is it's not just taking, like as you said, the work that you do in the classroom, because that's the pedagogy around face-to-face -face, um, uh, instruction is different than the pedagogy around virtual instruction. And so how do we not just take a video camera and try and do what we've been doing in a classroom, but how do we use the actual platform and design it to address the issues that we need to address, the, the skill develop, the structured literacy routines, um, so that they had lesson templates that they were develop, using to develop their lessons to deliver structured literacy instruction via this format. So it, it did look different than what they're doing in the classroom for special right. educators. The, the, the grid that was presented for Gabby is a great thing one-on-one. -on -one. Working in partnership with the gen ed teacher in the regular classroom, working in that yes. partnership to integrate it and things of that nature. I can see it working. I've done it. it, it, it it's a phenomenal tool in having that support. And it supports the socialization and not the isolation. My biggest concern is that in doing this, the isolation is going to cause a negative affect on the uh, socialization aspect with the child. I'm not trying to be overly critical. Oh, this no, is, yeah, I just want to clarify. A, 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 this is a, a phenomenal mountain to be climbed, and I don't know if it can, it, it's going to ever be solved. I don't see it being solved overnight. I just wanted to bring that up. I think yeah. the work and the implementation of doing this and working in the classroom and, and working in the partnership all the way up is a phenomenal thing and I'm glad to see it happen. Thank yeah. you. Oh yeah, I just want to add that that um, graphic organizer that Dr. Orkin shared, that's specific to determining special ed eligibility. This, the work that we would be doing in general ed is not, we are not using that level I, of- I understand that, but okay. that, that would be something she had, in the setting up the IEP, you'd refer to this and developing the plans and stuff and the gen ed teacher, you use it to support the gen ed teacher and show and examples and stuff. I'm not saying the direct implementation. I understand that, but I've said my piece. Thank you. Okay. Great, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Okay, so I'm speaking as not an educator. Um, and first, I, I guess I'm confused because as not an educator, <laughs> I thought there must be sort of a general best practice approach to dyslexia or and whereas it seems like you're kind of 
building this, which it sounds really good. I'm just confused because I would have thought it already existed. <laughs> um, so that's one kind of question. And right, then why, why don't we why don't we this doesn't have to be like the White House. One question at you, you get more questions. Let's do one question at a time. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Orkin, you want to speak to yeah, that? Sure. Quickly? Yeah, so um, so the way that we have set up the organizer reflects kind of these larger categories of where weaknesses can fall, whether they're in the domains of accuracy or fluency or oral language. Those are kind of the three big areas. And so each of those has its own set of recommended practices and curricula. So there are best practices, but it's not a one size fits all. And I think what, what can happen is that um, far too often there can be sort of this um, um, choice to use a one size fits all approach, like, you know, a, um, a common um, curriculum or a well known curriculum just becomes like the go to and it doesn't work for all kids. And so this is taking a much more um, kind of clinical um, targeted approach to look at, well, who is the student and where are their deficits? And this is how we're gonna individualize their educational. Plan. And that's really what started our collaboration because schools in general, you'll hear, oh, Wilson or Orton Gillingham are the gold standard for dyslexia. And so what we've been seeing, and Dr. Orkin, you hear this mirrored in district yeah. after district after district is, what do you do when Wilson doesn't work? Because right. you have these kids who were coming in and we were giving them Wilson because that's what you do for kids with an right. SLD in reading and they weren't responding uh, as we expected them to. And so, you know, looking at those five um, co core components that we really would go into that is that's where we started to really target and that's really where our conversation started three or four years ago um, when Dr. Orkin was the director of the Tufts um, Reading and Language Research Center. Um, she and I started talking when we were actually looking, they were looking for space to use in our building for the summer. And that conversation really started from me just saying, what do you do, what do, you do in your summer program? And her describing that to me um, really sparked that question of, well, what do you do when Wilson doesn't work? And it was like, well, what are you trying to do was really where it started so yeah. right i guess what i'm saying i mean it sounds really good i just thought it would have already been in place and have come down from i don't know desi or or, or just the general environment so okay so clearly that was a naive question um then my other question is just how does what you're doing inform the choices of approach that are then used in the classroom i think maybe you got to that in your later slides about resources and stuff but but does this mean does this help you pick which approaches will work best here or um what yeah, so that's exactly it. So, you know, as you, you know, the the educators have like a table of different curricula that we've provided them with. And so um, we have discussions about these different curricula, but I think also having school-based consults where we meet and we talk about cases and we have the opportunity to really work through and analyzing results and interpreting them and planning instruction has been really great to kind of support the implementation of this framework and, and lead to instructional. It certainly has helped us, Dr. Allison Ampi, to also look at where we're going to target PD. Yeah. Because as Dr. Orkin said, for each of those deficit areas, there are um, curricula that are designed to address them. But that doesn't mean that you're going to get trained in all three of those curricula that are designed to address fluency, right? So we have to obviously, you know, look at and prioritize, okay, we're going to train teachers in this, you know, so whether that was sight words you can see um, to address something or, you know, we have a group uh, with Orton yeah. Gillingham yeah. Um, with some work that we did with um, Belmont. So that's, we've used that kind of information to also help us plan PD but and, and target PD um, and also what curricula we're going to purchase because obviously we have to then invest in that. Um, in right. That. right. Right. I guess my question was kind of, how do you decide what gets on that chart? 
you know, that, that the teachers are then picking from? Oh, how do you choose from the curriculum? I mean, I just chose kind of, you know, I, I've worked in the field for over a decade, so I know kind of the, the major curriculum. So um, I've, I've chosen the ones that I know of just from the research, but also we refer to, you know, guidelines, the federal, federal leave, you know, vested um, 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 programs like the, um, I can't remember the name, but there are websites that the federal government has set up where they go through and they have like a clearing house where they look at different curricula and the Department of Education for Massachusetts is now engaging in that process. So there are lots of sources for these different programs. And they're also, you know, some of the publishers, right, own some of this stuff, you know, so, um, you know, there, I think there are some core ones that you, you will see regionally, right, like yeah. in, in Massachusetts in particular, OG and Wilson are really big, um, they may not, you know, it helps that, you know, Barbara Wilson lives around here, right, uh, you know, so I think some of that stuff is also driven by, you know, your regions. Yeah, your location. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this presentation. My, <clears throat> I, I just have two questions. One is, um, you know, the, it sounds like you're, you're offering workshops, but what, is, what does it look like in terms of um, individual, coaching of individual teachers as they um, restructure, modify, and improve their practice? And to what extent do you bring data into um, the conversation about improving individual practice? So for professional development, you know, we have the early release schedule for elementary. So for the last three years, we have used our early, our early release time for learning specialists. We, we began with learning specialists, school psychologists, and speech and language pathologists because we were looking at those assessment batteries initially, as you saw the progression of the work we were doing. And then as we shifted to the instructional piece, we've really targeted our um, learning specialists and our, our team chairs just so they can you know, help guide that um, decision-making process. And so that's kind of the work we've been doing largely as a department. And then as Dr. Organ mentioned, we, two years ago, we started implementing the school-based consultation. So she's been working with individual school teams for the students they're actually working with. Um, we did that with special ed first. And then last year, for those of you who um, recall, AEF funded a grant for Dr. Orkin to work with general educators. So she did a second round with them. But we um, were originally doing that at, um, for special ed teams. And then we also, as part of Dr. Orkin's consultation, at each of those um, professional development opportunities, we have office hours. So you can sign up in advance um, and you bring your that completed uh, graphic organizer we described to an individual planning session with Dr. Orkin, usually me and the other coordinator uh, will sit in and we'll go over an individual student that a person has question about. And then in some rare cases, Dr. Orkin has been a consultant on an individual student case for us, you know, actually participating in the IEP process. Good. I, I was trying to understand how deep it went into the, so that, thank you for clarifying that. I might have missed it during the presentation, that's possible. The other point is, I mean, is it possible for us to get, um, <clears throat> this has been a three-year engagement, three-year partnership, which I think, by the way, sounds great. I'm not, I, this is not, uh, I'm not critiquing it. Is there a way to get some data on how our numbers have moved over the course of the past three years um, for students and IEPs, at least in literacy? Is that a possible possibility? So I, th I think, you know, you would be looking at individual scores in that regard, or you were looking at their outcomes. Cause Outco in, I don't know, I, no. in IEPs, we're always measuring against their individual IEP, yeah, I don't know. what that looks like in, you know, um, MCAS data would be the largest one, or as Dr. Orkin's talking about how the, that grade level data that we're working to try and incorporate that stuff. Um, Obviously, I don't want student names and I don't want to get that. I'm not asking for that. I'm in any sort of presentation that gives us a chart that shows, you know, what the impact has been statistically in terms of data would be a good thing to see. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, we don't have that for you today. So I, know you don't, I know you don't have that for me today. I didn't expect it today. <laughs> this is a, a presentation about the work that's being done. I understand that. But I mean, going forward, uh, at some point, I think that would just be helpful to kind of um, have the data that you've used to measure um, the impact of this work. And I mean, student data. Yeah. 
there's also the data on like the adoption of the of the graphic organizer. Yeah, the, yeah. Too, yeah. yeah and I mean, that's valid. That's perfectly valid. The adoption. Yeah. I, I, per, I understand that. But I also yeah. to go beyond that. It's like, you know, <clears throat> scores of some sort or something yeah. that shows shows growth. Yeah. That would be good to have. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Mr. Shukman, you're next. And now that I'm unmuted. Um, <clears throat> So we've collected a lot of data, it sounds like. Uh, how, how are we storing this and working with this for any kind of a longitudinal look? Is that being done or is this all very ad hoc on an individual basis? So I think that's kind of what Mr. Thielman was getting at. I, I believe if Mr. Thielman is what you were asking. Um, I mean, yes, we're I using it in the day to day for an individual individual students as part of their IEP process um, because we're reporting on individual students throughout their, um, you know, their progress reporting and uh, at their, obviously at their annual review and we're charting their progress against their individual IEP goals because we're using this data to, as we mentioned, to inform the IEP goals, to inform the objectives and to inform the instructional tool. So we are collecting that currently as on an individual basis per student to reflect that back on their progress in the IEP process. I mean, how we would love to, and that going forward, uh, we closed the presentation with, how do we start getting this data large scale across the district around, which ties to the, um, the early literacy screening that's required across the state, and how are we using progress monitoring tools to shape instruction at the in the gen ed class as well um i think that's certainly where we mentioned we would like this collaboration to go um yeah that's sort of where know. i was that's sort of where i was going with the question i'm sort of looking at this as uh how much uh, how many of these assessments are being conducted outside of the iep or sped process and how many of them are we looking at going forward as being useful for the entire population to sort of get a feeling of how the, the whole distribution of students moving yeah, through Yeah, Dr. Orkin can speak to those tools, but I can tell you locally, uh, they did add the RAN-RAS, which is one of those measures we talked about. Um, and we have started using the DIBBLES also um, in for those general ed purposes. But Dr. Orkin, you can talk about more of that broader large-scale process yeah I mean most of the most of the assessments that we discussed are for eligibility testing they're, they're standardized by nature and so they're really for individual administration um, and there some of the progress monitoring tools that we talked about are appropriate for general population um, and can be used as a way to understand how the general population is progressing in these different component areas um, would Dr. McNeil like to talk a little bit about this? Because we do have um, a data bank that we have created in the district. And this is more broad in terms of gen ed. I don't, I don't, Dr. McNeil, are you there? Do you want to just quickly talk a, a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, so we have uh, utilized information that we have uh, received regarding early literacy in order to make certain decisions of changing the assessments, the battery of assessments that we give to our mm -hmm. kindergarten and first grade students. And, and we also have a plan of adding on assessments at the second grade level that align with the information that Dr. Orkin has uh, given us to our, to, given us, uh, given to our general educators. So we do have a plan of, you know, identifying those assessments so we're able to get the information and understand and use them as predictors as to successful, you know, in gaining students gaining successful, the skills that they need to be successful readers. Um, mm -hmm. So that is the work that we're doing and we're capturing all of that in the data bank. So th that information will be there and we, be, we will be able to look at it longitudinally as we continue down the road and uh, as we continue to give these assessments uh, every year. So my follow-up question would be the typical one. Uh, what do you need from us going forward? What policy or uh, thoughts or resources do you need from the school committee uh, to go to the next level? So um, just 
the DES, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey's earlier question, um, once the uh, early literacy screening um, legislation, like known as the dyslexia legislation passed, the, it went to the DESC to promulgate the regulations and then offer guidance to the districts. They have not done that yet. Um, Dr. Orkin and I um, are part of the stakeholder group um, from across the state that were helping them to inform um, how they roll out their guidance to states or to districts within the state and uh, how to do that. I mean, I think, you know, we, funded some of this stuff, like I said, through AEF grants. Uh, initially, we looked to the AEF to help purchase the um, decodable text libraries. Those are not inexpensive items. Um, some of these, the universal screeners that we would need to implement wide scale um, as part of the legislation, but also as part of best practice, you know, have a dollar value attached to it somewhat nominally um, when you use measures like the Dibbles in conjunction with other measures. The Dibbles alone is not the screening tool, it's in conjunction with other measures. Um, and also the continued, you know, collaboration, the PD work that we've done, you know, the reason we've stuck with it for three years is because we know that, that districts in general, schools in general tend to do, you know, one year they focus on one topic and then the next year they jump to another topic and we've continued with this topic so that people can develop a, a deep knowledge so the work that needs to happen with general educators to get this we're talking about right we're the special ed department so we're working with kids who've been referred or in the process of being referred to special ed ideally if K to two, we get really good at this. That should also drop the referral rate to special ed because we are we're getting these kids. We're we're identifying them early. We're intervening strategically and effectively, and they're not then you know developing the you know they're not they're not needing to be referred to special ed. So I I think the the training for teachers administering the um the screeners takes resources of time and people. Um, those are some of the things that come up. And on the general education side, as we're looking to build our model of, to support literacy instruction. So, I mean, our five-year plan is to have a reading coach in every building. Therefore, we would have uh, coaches at the building that they could, uh, that teachers could access and they can have more um, conversations about instruction and utilizing the data in order to look at instructional techniques to build the capacity, uh, the skill set of the general education teacher so they can provide that tier one uh, intervention so that that will also help with uh, limiting the referrals to special education. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Ms. Morgan, you're up. Um, so my question is what would be the vision for so we have a, we have Gabby, right? Um, and how would her graphic organizer be shared with her family or her parents? So the way that we've been um, working on it in workshops is just as you see it. Basically, you know, there would be um, a conversation first about kind of what I what I um, provided for you about how you know reading achievement, what it looks like reading a book and answering questions about what you read like that is the end result. And there are all of these steps along the way. And so we wanna know how Gabby is performing in each of those different steps or stages. And so, you know, giving some background that can be accessible for families who might not have, you know, a background in education or, or reading or what have you. And, and then being able to explain, you know, they're usually um, at team meetings, and at least for an initial eval, you know, each person that's done the testing has goes around and explains in depth sort of what the testing shows, but this would be kind of a centralized approach where you would explain, you know, using the graphic organizer, how did she do in accuracy skills? Well, this is one assessment that she was given and this is how she scored and this is what it looked like when she was given this assessment. So it would help to maybe org organize it for families um, to see where strengths and weaknesses lie in their child. And also then using it to explain, right, as we talk about developing the IEP goals, that okay. becomes the reference point in order to address the accuracy issues. So that we're going to develop a goal in X, Y, and Z, and then talk about the methodology for um, achieving that. Right. 
And so, so it's like mailed. I mean, they're part of the student record. So I mean, there's certainly, but it's not something that you just we send home and you look through it without. Yeah. Understood. I, so I guess my question is, is that this something like what we're seeing for Gabby wouldn't be generated unless it was in a situation where there was we were in the process, like it was a referral or we were doing a review. Is that correct? Right. Well, that that one is specifically for special education. There are, um, you know, versions of it that we've shared with districts that are for general education for how to you know, again, differentiate in those three categories, but using um, assessment tools that are um, that are used within the general population, like the Dibbles or something like that. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks. I'm I'm last, um, so I want to congratulate uh, Ms. Elmer, and Dr. Orkin, and the administration on this initiative. I think. You know, dating back from before Ms. Elmer was here, you know, reading services, the district took the position that reading services aren't even a special education service. So we've come a long way as a district in recognizing that they are a, a service and that they have this evaluation approach, uh, very detailed, um, you know, too late for my kids. But uh, I do know uh, parents that are, are, are um, especially on the, on the team meetings that Mr. Orkin participates in, uh, that are very appreciative of, of the new approach here. Um, I, I do hope that we can continue to expand it to regular ed. You know, I'm still hearing, you know, we still seem to have, uh, it's not really one size fits all, but it's pretty close to that. So definitely that continues as we, you know, it's gonna be a funding priority for me to get the reading coaches eventually um, uh, so that we can continue to differentiate the learning uh, for, our general ed population uh, in, in the same way. Um, so thank you all for for that. Um, just one point on the on the data. You know, one thing that we're already always struggling with as a committee is is justifying our budget. So we want to add those reading coaches, but we want to be able to show data at some point that what we that by adding those coaches, by adding this new way of evaluating students, we're making progress somehow. So maybe the special ed population isn't the right place to do that because it is so individual, the numbers are really small. There probably still should be some impact on our MCAS scores on closing the achievement gap with our special ed population overall. So maybe that is somewhere to look, but definitely as we roll it out to regular ed, we, we, we want to measure the impact of a, of a program like this. I think that's, that's I don't want to speak for them, but I think that's part of what um, Mr. Thielman and, and Mr. Strickland were reflecting. All right, Mr. Hainer, one last thing. Just real quick for clarification. Uh, I understand the learning disabilities belong on the SPED, but if it mainly a reading issue, my understanding was reading was removed from the SPED uh, connection several years ago. Am I wrong in that, Ms. Alma? Um, I mean, I, I think what uh, Mr. Cardin's talking about is something prior to um, my time here. Um, however, it's always been the case that if you are eligible for, um, if you're found eligible for special education services under a specific learning ability in the area of reading, you should be getting your reading services outlined in your IEP. Now the question okay. is, can a reading specialist deliver that or a learning specialist both able to deliver it? And so that's where the collaboration, we still have reading specialists who are delivering those services in the IEP as well okay. as servicing students who are in tiered intervention, right? That's outside of special ed. Those that and that's the area where Dr. Ork and I are saying I, I was just all I was trying to do was support what Mr. Cardin said. And the idea that reading is is all is a very broad thing and we shouldn't limit it just to one area. That's all. Thank you. All right. Well thank you both for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ork. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. All right, Mr. Mason, you're up next with the, uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Bodie, you're next with the, nope, sorry, I, yep. Um, Mr. It's, it's listed for Dr. Bodie, but so the FY21 budget update, whoever's gonna present. Dr. Bodie, you're on mute though. I know, I, I'm muting. Um, I think what we really wanna talk about is what, 
the discussion has been going on relative to FY21 in terms of the state budget and the effects that could be having on Arlington. And that those meetings occurred last week along range planning, but there's also been other meetings as well as we trying to assess what the effect of the pandemic is going to be on uh, revenue for the state and therefore what will happen in turn to local receipts as well as chapter 70, which is the money that comes in for, for uh, public schools. So it, we have been working very closely with the town, Mr. Pooler and uh, Mr. Chapelain to look at this, these issues. And um, Mr. Pooler has also put together uh, many uh, uh, five year looks at the budget and what the effects will be. Uh, the town manager and myself, and actually uh, Mr. Mason and Mr. Pooler are going to the finance committee meeting on June 1st to discuss the FY21 budget. But um, right now we can, let's take a look uh, first at what these long range views are, as well as what we presented last week in terms of we had to reduce um, some uh, some of the positions we are looking to fill next year, what would that look like? I think the, the proposal, well, let's actually maybe get some of the documents up so everybody can see them. Mr. Mason, can you pull them up? Yes, I can. Just give me one second, okay? Okay, thank you. Share screen. Um, okay. Why don't you take over from here and talking about um, both documents? Yeah, all right. Uh, good evening, school committee members. Um, I. Uh, attached uh, or the documents that I have in front of you tonight or this evening is um, a series of three documents that was shared with the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, the first document that I have shared on my screen here is um, two different models um, and our discussions of some school committee members that were present, um, uh, we discussed uh, some different options and the two options were uh, one that was proposed was looking at how the FY21 budget would look like if we had a decrease of about $460,000, which was a 10% reduction of what the increase of our budget was compared to FY20, which was originally about a $4.6 million budget. Um, the chart that's shown uh, shows our current year budget uh, compared to what we proposed um, that the school committee uh, voted to accept and um, and then where we would make changes uh, to the proposed budget to come to this reduced budget um, and as you will see is that it would lead to um, a reduction of about seven positions um, and it would result in a reduction in, in an administrative position and uh, about six and a half teaching uh, or professional staff positions. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that those would be teachers, but these were all reductions to the, what we added, the ad list. Um, and I'm gonna change the tabs to show you this, this plan. Um, and this plan uh, uh, would call out a reduction of the not going forward with doing assistant principal in fiscal 21, uh, as well as uh, removing the, the, the additional teachers for the, the seventh, uh, the learning community at the, uh, the half learning community at the Audison Middle School, um, reducing uh, some, uh, the one teacher position at the high school level and Re reducing two reserve teaching positions in addition to as well 
a physical therapy assistant and a BCBA position that was proposed, which all at total up to four hundred sixty thousand um, dollars. And this was a, a drafted plan. This is not a final plan. Um, uh, I think there are things that still need to be worked out uh, between the administration because, as you know, we worked along with the, uh, the rest of the district administration on coming up with this plan, and we have yet to been able to sit down and discuss this with all the district administrators. Um, Can I add a comment in here too? Um, yes. Even since we presented it last week, I already know that we're going to have to do some work on it because I'm getting kindergarten numbers and what the effect of those kindergarten numbers are going to have, particularly in two schools, potentially three schools um, as we go forward. So if you notice two of the, the reductions were in reserve positions, we very likely are going to need those and are going to have to do a redistribution. So what we have said to the Long Range Planning Committee is that this is the locus of what the additions are and what we will be reducing, whatever that percentage is, probably 10%, will come from this list. The question is, will we, will we do some adjustments between uh, once we have a final number and what's on this list? Um, okay, good. Um, so the next, if you still see my screen, I hope so, because I hit something that I hope I didn't change. But the next uh, proposal was a uh, proposal which was a little more drastic, which was a level funded budget, meaning our budget uh, in FY21 would remain the same as our FY20. And in our budget, uh, we had about 2.5, 2.6 million dollars worth of salary increases. And in a level funded budget, we would have to figure out how to still provide contractual salary increases uh, based on what uh, that has been bargained between the different union groups and the school committee um, and the district administration, of course. But this plan, uh, which we possibly we could not do this plan, um, which would remove all the additions. And on top of that, this additional column of reduction and layoffs, these would actually be positions that we would have to remove from our budget, along with reductions of about a 10% reduction to our supply, our supply and department budget, departmental budgets. And in this proposal, um, along with the 22 to 23 positions that were added from the budget, we would also be removing another 40 positions um, of actual staff in our current staffing model. And this would not be providing the same level of service that the, the district is currently providing to the community. This would actually be uh, a reduction of service. And uh, there's, I don't see how this could be a plan that goes forward. But, the, the third document does show the reduction in all these positions. And um, that would basically sum up the two different options. And I, I don't have any additional comments at this moment beyond I, would, I, I cannot see, I don't know how we would operate. And considering we, there's so many unknown expenditures that we have going for um, next year in terms of we're not even sure how we're going to, what kind of operation it will be. And so with that, there's some unknown expenditures. And so that might even cause additional cuts um, in this particular plan. So um, this is uh, obviously a plan, but we're not sure beyond this. But uh, Kathy, you have anything to add? No, that's a good summary. Yeah, well, the, the I mean, the consensus of the Long Range Planning Committee, we, it's not a committee that takes formal votes, but the consensus was to pursue the the first option. Correct. Dr. Allison Ampe, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I wanted to make it clear to our viewing audience of who knows how many, um, that the second plan, the level, level funded plan, was prepared as part of a request 
from the Long Range Planning Committee um, to have options to choose from. Um, it was not something that the school committee supports or school committee members who discussed it supported. It's not something that the administration supported, but it was something that we were requested to create and thus did so, um, as did the town, uh, as part of the exercise in looking at how going forward we can knowing that we're going into a time when revenue is unstable and likely to decline, how we can manage our budget as wisely as possible. Um, so. Yeah, I would just add a, a little bit to that. Um, so the, the proposal is to cut 10% of our increase, not 10% of our budget. So that's why it's only 460,000. So it's 10% of our increase our increase was, you know, four and a half million. So, um, so we're still getting a very large budget increase, which would be very, which if you look at the headlines in other towns is, is very unusual. We're, we're able to do that largely because we passed the override last year and the town does have funds um, to cover that shortfall, even if there's a, a significant uh, state aid cut. The state aid cut is completely uncertain. We don't know if the federal government's gonna come in um, and, and provide money either directly to us or to the state so they can lower their cuts. We don't, there's a lot of uncertainty, but the feeling at long range planning was we need to cut a little bit at least um, to be a little bit more conservative because of all the uncertainty and the, and the extreme likelihood that there will be some budget cuts. So um, fortunately, in, 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 you know, in my view, 460,000 is you know, it's significant. There are positions there that are going away that we need, um, but uh, it could be a whole lot worse. And that's what the second scenario shows. If we didn't get any more money, if we got just the same money that we had this year, what would be the impact? And it would be a really terrible impact. But but other districts are facing that, so um, we are we are very fortunate. Mr. Hayner, you had a question. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Mason, the figure of sixty-five thousand dollars for the FTE is that an average salary? Yes. I, I'd ask you to consider using a, bachelor, a master's step one as a figure, because that's the, a, a, a good position to hire in, where uh, just to make it a little bit more palatable uh, going forward. You understand where I'm coming from? No, I understand where you're coming from. We, I think $65,000, yeah, I'm not asking you to, the input a bachelor's step one because I think that would be very hard to get out of yeah, the market. Yes. We, I, we discussed this at budget and that's the number we use when I thought what number did we use Mr. Mason when we developed the budget? So the original when we did last year's budget was the placeholder was 60,000. This year we changed it to 65,000. We did a we did an exercise where we looked at the average salary that we were hiring at for a new teacher. And our new teachers for the first year average was around $64,700. So we put in uh, the, the placeholder for $65,000. Our actually average teacher salary is actually higher. Than I understand that. Offline, would you just send me what a master step one is, please? Yes. Thank you. Yep. Okay, is there any other questions or comments? So at some point- um, Might I suggest that we put up the other chart so that People watching this don't see this draconian <laughs> chart. Thank you. So uh, at, at some point in June, we'll, we will have to vote a revised budget, um, uh, preferably before a town meeting. So probably at our first June meeting, um, uh, Ms. Morgan. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll need from the administration a little bit more detail about where that 460,000 is going to come. Obviously there's a lot of uncertainty this year um, about what, going to be spent on anything in the fall, but uh, at least for, for, for modifying the budget that we adopted, we'll need something on paper to vote on. Mr. Schlickman, did you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to point out two things. One, we may, not ha we may need to cut things that we anticipated spending on in, in a budget, no matter what it is, because we need to move towards more um, 
equipment, software, uh, materials that are suitable for distance learning. And the second thing I just want to emphasize is that when we went to the town last year for the override, we committed ourselves uh, to a couple of things, one of which was uh, a certain level of service out of the school department. And I just want to make sure that we maintain that vision, that we committed to the families who went out and worked for this override, that if you vote for this, we will provide this level of service. And, and uh, that's also critical to me. Um, may I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. Um, I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, but I also want to piggyback on what Mr. Carden said. We are in a very fortunate position in Arlington that we are looking at the reductions in our increases because I know that in comparisons of what's going on, that's not the case. And it's um, because of the voters in Arlington, we are where we are. And also because of the, the kind of careful planning the town does around budgeting, looking at five-year projections, uh, making very conservative assumptions that even when we get more chapter 70 or we get th that variability that can happen, we work on, a, on an agreed upon formula which shows a lot of collaboration uh, town and school. So the voters in Arlington, um, I think, can be very pleased in knowing that by voting for the override, um, they, they're helping the town and the schools uh, be able to um, buffer the effects of what we're going through as a, as a commonwealth and country. Yeah, I, I do understand that. And I, and I think that the, for, uh, the 400 and some odd thousand dollar reduction in the increase for this year is probably manageable, but I, you know, all we're looking at is the hypothetical numbers. Uh, I haven't seen a need statement for what we think we need to do going forward in order to run a system uh, that would be dual track to uh, uh, on-site and distance learning. And it's tough to uh, think about how we should respond to the budget without knowing what we think in our professional opinion is required in order to provide learning next year, professional development, equipment, technology, software, and support that we never anticipated in the uh, fiscal 20 budget. That, that, yeah, that's all I'm saying. I, you've got one piece of the pie. The, the hypothetical is cutting 10% of the increase, uh, but it's being overlaid on, uh, on nothing in terms of an analysis of what we need to do differently. And certainly there are expenses that we won't have next year, or maybe there are things that we can buy uh, closing out in the 20 budget uh, that would help us uh, move forward in 21. But I, I, I just want to lay that down right now because uh, I feel uncomfortable with the uncertainty on all the other uh, levels of this budget. May I, Mr. Carden? Sure, briefly. Uh, I totally agree with you. And I think that's one of the, the difficulties we face. There are some things that we know we need next year, regardless of what is going to happen in terms of a, learn, a learning plan. We, we need more computers. We can't share computers. We need, there's no sharing of a lot of materials. We've, talked to, we've been talking about uh, the kind of containers we need. The, the mass that we need, um, all, all of the uh, protection gear. So there's things that we can anticipate that we know we're gonna have to have regardless. If we go, some plans might require a different kinds of technology equipment than others. And I, and I, I want to, to yep. pardon? Sorry, just, I'm just trying to wrap it up because we're, oh, we're I see. Okay. running along. Well, we can talk more about this at an upcoming meeting then. Glenn. Yes, Mr. Thielman. You know, I missed my turn. I'm so sorry. I was in a conversation. No, no, that's all right. We didn't go around. I just was looking for hands on this one. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, you know, um, I, you know, I think I, I appreciate this presentation. It's very helpful. I mean, I, I think we got to meet, uh, you know, as often as necessary over the summer so that we're um, 
kept abreast of any developments that are going to impact the budget. We haven't heard about stimulus money yet uh, that might come to uh, municipalities and states. Uh, and so I think we just have to be ready to meet to make, uh, you know, to make some decisions. And the other thing is the real, the reality is going to hit, I think, in FY22. Um, and right. that's going to be um, the challenge for, you know, all districts across the United States. And so I just think we need to be, I don't really know what the response is right now, but when I study this in my own organization and, you know, and other things, uh, the scary year is FY22, it seems to me. But uh, So I just want to throw that out there and uh, that's all I want to say. Great, thanks. Anybody else? All right. So the next item is the MASC contract uh, for superintendent search. Mr. Shipman, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, in, in the packet, you have the minutes of our meeting of uh, May 20th, uh, where we discussed several aspects of the uh, MASC proposal. Uh, the basic numbers are that the fee to MASC would be $10,500 plus expenses. Uh, Mr. Kucher said that ex travel expenses for MASC would be unbelievably low as the consultants are in Cambridge and there's very little travel on their part. Um, any expenses for advertising would be on our option. Um, any expenses for travel for candidates would only likely be for a finalist if we have an out-of-state candidate where we want to come in. Because of the minimal nature of the expenses, uh, the recommendation going forward is to, uh, and, and I'll make the motion formally now, I've got it written down, uh, motion to authorize the chair to sign an agreement with MASC to serve as our consultant in the superintendent search for a sum of $10,500 plus expenses not to exceed $500 without school committee approval. So that would be the motion that uh, oh, we have a second there. Uh, that would be the motion before us that will move us forward on, 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 the, on the contract. Now, we also want to move uh, forward aggressively in terms of doing some of the work. And the two things that are important right now is to do the community and staff outreach and to start work on the promotional materials for the district, some of which are demographic, some of which will be generated out of the uh, focus groups and, and survey that will be conducted by MASC. Uh, the search process committee will meet to, uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m. And at that point, we will be talking to Mr. Kucher about constituency groups within Arlington that we think are important for him to look at. Some people such as the town manager and the incumbent superintendent as being somebody we'd want to, ooh, uh, uh, the superintendent, are, are, are you with me, Glenn? Am I coming through? Okay, because I got a little instability here on the Zoom. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, some people would need to be interviewed individually, such as the town manager or the current superintendent. Some people would be uh, interviewed in groups, and MASC has stated that they will go and hold as many focus groups as necessary to get everybody who wants to uh, get in on this. So uh, I think it's going to be a very inclusive process, but the question is, who do we need to reach out to? And that uh, Glenn is looking for uh, guidance in a list so that uh, that's what we'll be talking about next Tuesday and if any member has suggestions they want to put forward and they're not going to be attending Tuesday's meeting I would ask you to send that uh, directly to Mr. Kucher so we avoid any open meeting uh, public records issues. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so there's a motion that's been seconded and we'll go around for comment and question first. Mr. Hayner, any comments or questions? Not at this time. Dr. Allison Ampey? Support the motion. I have questions about process, but I'm, they're not relevant to the motion. 
So should I wait? Uh, sure, yeah, let's get the motion down first. Uh, Mr. Thielman? I support the motion. Uh, and, and Ms. Morgan? Good. All right, yes, and thank you, Paul, for and the, your subcommittee for uh, organizing this and, and, and getting this done. Uh, it's, you know, the MASE has a lot of experience doing these searches and, uh, and they'll be a great partner for us. Um, so roll call vote, Mr. Hayner? Yes. Dr. Ellison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlippen? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I also vote yes, unanimous. Okay, uh, let's go around with any other questions on the process. Uh, Mr. Hayner? Who seconded no. that motion? Mr. Hayner did. Thank you. I have nothing but gratitude for the subcommittee and all the work they've done. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Allison Ampey? Um, looking at the timeline that we were given, um, I'm concerned about it thinking about when we'll get the election results back and when we have our first meeting which is when we install our new member um, and in particular i'm concerned about having an approved survey on june 8th when we have three seats open and the possibility of even two new members um, coming in and having the survey come out before they're on board um, I, I I don't think we need to do the survey and approve it until after the election. Where we re, re, where we really need to get started right now and work quickly is to uh, do focus groups with the staff because uh, they're with us till mid June and then they're going to be harder to get a hold of. So that's why we really need to start. But the other process is to uh, look at uh, people in groups that are important for the focus groups. And that could be added on later as well. So we're not cementing ourselves into anything at this point, nor will we next Tuesday. Okay, that, that helps. Um, and also, again, for our audience, I wanna make it clear, although we're going to start talking to faculty quickly, as Mr. Hanner says, because they kind of have an expiration date of going off to summer, whatever summer means this year, um, we really wanna to talk to parents um, and we'll be working out that all those outreach um, very soon too. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Thielman? Yes, um, Kersey raised the question I had about the survey and the time to do that. The question, another question that I have is that at some point in this process, our group, the committee, um, has to come together and um, we have to be a focus group. Um, you know, it's, it's very typical in a search uh, that <clears throat> for, you know, any, any major position, uh, leader of a nonprofit organization, head of a private school, uh, head of a school that the hiring body, the board of uh, directors or the school committee in our case, has a meeting with a search consultant at some point in our, in our world that has to be in a public session, I understand, uh, in which we, um, in which that governing body talks about what it wants in a uh, leader. Sometimes it's, it's after their focus groups and surveys have taken place and we get a chance to sift through them and talk. Um, but it's really important that the firm doing the search hears from us. So I just want to make sure that at some point in this process, we're, we, we schedule that. Um, I guess we got to do it by this uh, method of meeting. I understand that, uh, but I really just want to make sure that we we start to plan for it because people, I don't know if anyone's going to go away this summer, but um, you know, July and August, there are other things happening in people's lives. So I, I, mean, I just want to point that out to Paul and uh, the, the committee. And I do want to praise the committee for doing a great job with this. This is a, you know, this is the, you know, we <clears throat> we really wanted this process to be moving quicker. We wanted it to get started earlier. Um, we obviously have hit quite a snag here in COVID-19, but I just want to remind uh, everybody that's really important that our group, there is a time schedule in which we talk about this information and talk to each other um, about what we're looking for in a new leader. That's a real important step in any search. That's fundamental to a search. I agree with Mr. Thielman, and I'm sure that there'll be uh, an event scheduled. And we don't have to be physically present as well either, 
so that if somebody's going away someplace and can get into a Zoom, we can do that. So we're a little less dependent on yeah. uh, making sure everybody is in Arlington physically at the time that we go and do a, a focus with the consultant. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, Mr. Morgan. Any questions or comments on the? Okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we, we'll have the subcommittee meeting next week. Um, uh, and uh, as I as I noted on the uh, on a Facebook comment, there will be focus groups. Um, there will be a lot of them. Uh, anybody, you know, there will be a, a formal survey that will come out to the community at some point uh, in June. Um, and there will be lots of opportunity to shape the community vision for um, what we're looking for in a new superintendent. So thank you, Paul. All right, next item is the EDCO update from Dr. Bodhi. Uh, thank you. Um, the reason uh, this is on the agenda this evening is that the Board of Directors for EDCO, um, to which I am the liaison from the Arlington Public Schools and from the school committee, is meeting uh, on June 4th and is going to take a very uh, consequential vote. And I wanted to uh, talk with you this evening about that and um, uh, recommend uh, my position on it. But first of all, I think that we, I, I wanna give you a little bit of background where, how this started. This, um, ETCO, first of all, is an organization that's in its 51st year. And Arlington was one of the um, originating, uh, one of the early, I should say, members of, of EDCO. Um, in fact, EDCO was going to celebrate its 50th anniversary um, back no in November. This has happened before. It happened about a decade ago. Uh, uh, the EDCO organization had a deficit this year. Um, it was caused by a couple of things. One of them had to do with um, a major grant that was they did not receive. It, it had to do with an overestimation of the number of students that would be in different programming. And as a result, back four months ago, the deficit was at 1.7. Through the leadership of the current of the executive director, Nadine Ekstrom, that deficit has come down to 274. Um, so $247,000. So in order to um, make sure that we are not ending the year in a deficit, uh, all of the uh, EDCO members, there's 16 of the member districts, have been asked to pay their portional share of that. For Arlington, that is about uh, $21,500. To put that amount of money in perspective, um, our current assessment is about $14,700. And this is half, the $14,700 is half of what it was uh, three years ago. One of the goals has been to, uh, to reduce member assessments over these years. So this additional assessment really brings us back a little bit more than where we were three years ago. Um, so a plan was developed for that as we look at a plan for um, FY21. The plan shows right now a, a surplus of about 240,000. But one of the things that, uh, that happened as a result of this deficit, uh, the member districts were surprised that uh, the Lexington School Committee voted to begin termination process for EDCO. And a member district can do one of two things. It, it, it can withdraw from the organization. It, you have a lead year on that to, in order to do it. Um, it also can, if, a, if the school committee votes this, can uh, initiate the process of termination. And that again also takes a year term. So it was quite a surprise. We had a, a board meeting that was newly called last week to discuss the pros and cons of uh, whether uh, the um, EDCO should begin that process. Under the Articles of Agreement, what happens is if, if there's a two-thirds vote of the board, then you begin the process of determining assets, liabilities, and 
it takes a year for that process to uh, have a conclusion. Uh, in, anticip in anticipation of that, it was not much lead time, the business managers that, managers that we had hired this year, when the business manager um, left in February, did an assessment of what those costs would be. Um, they had been the people that also worked with the dissolution of another collaborative and so they were very familiar with all the cost categories that would have to be addressed and made um, some determination of what that amount of money would be. And it's in the neighborhood of 600 million. Uh, you have uh, that, those estimates. I think that number could come down a little bit depending upon how the organization would uh, negotiate the remaining years on the lease. But the point is that once that once a letter is received, you have to go forward with a formal uh, vote of the of the board of directors, which will happen on June fourth. And I wanted you to be aware um, that this was um, happening. And um, I personally do not think that Arlington should either withdraw or vote for termination. Um, in, in terms of the finances of this, it's it's really sort of a, a it's definitely clear that that would not be to our, our advantage. One of the, one of the um, uh, benefits of being a member is that we have a differential rate on special education programming compared to non-members. Uh, that differential is, is $12,500. So one student, and we have more than one student at EDCO, um, very comes close to what our assessment is. In addition to that, uh, we are, had previously been members of a, a EMI and then they went to a geo slope scan and now ideas is that the evolution of that organization is now part of EDCO and as part of our membership, we are, have the services of, of ideas, which is an organization that focuses on uh, cultural proficiency, professional development, and we not only have used them, but we also have a presenters that are part of our staff. Um, we also, as an organization, take full advantage of all the roundtables that exist for in, in EDCO, uh, by, by curriculum area, by technology, uh, assistant superintendent, superintendent, uh, and uh, these, these are free to us as part of the membership. So there are a lot of good reasons why we should remain a member financially for one, because if we were, if the process went forward, our share of that 6 million would be close to half a million dollars um, based on the percentage that, that um, the assessments are based on. And that's a function of your enrollment. So um, some school committees have looked at this. Uh, I know Newton last night looked at, at this and uh, they have decided not to withdraw and not to terminate. Um, and so what I'm asking for you this evening um, is uh, your guidance, uh, affirmation of our membership and would like to open that up for comments. But before I do that, I, I also want you to know that the business managers for the member districts had an opportunity to talk with the um, the, man the management consultant group. And I would like Mr. Mason, if you could just talk for a moment on uh, what, what, what happened with that meeting. Yeah, so the business managers met uh, and we discussed the situation from our lens, trying to seek out what the options would be. And my main takeaway from that uh, meeting was that many of the business managers that were involved on that uh, that Zoom meeting, or it was a virtual meeting, I forget the platform, but um, they they left feeling secure and positive about the future of EDCO and that they were in support um, of continuing being members of, of this collaborative. Um, there was a lot of questions that were asked in terms of um, what safeguards would be put in place for to ensure that uh, no issues would happen going forward and how do they intend to ensure services well how would they uh, uh, 
uh, evolved during this time in, of COVID-19. And, you know, um, the director and the outsourced firm seemed uh, very confident and had answered all the questions correctly. So it, um, it comes as a surprise as a, uh, that some, some districts may still have a, a reason to pull out, but um, I think that all the business managers saw that it made sense financially. And for Arlington, I don't think that, I mean, we look at what may happen going forward in terms of our finances, um, I think it was best to support uh, the collaborative at this moment um, in order to ensure that we do not take a big hit uh, in terms of this financial situation that's happening over at EDCO. That's all I have to say today. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to note that, you know, I, we got to this note this we got information about this last night um i did not have a chance today to try to reach out to the lexington school committee chair to see if there was any more information um uh so i think our decision tonight is unfortunately incomplete um uh, but i i will going forward whatever vote we take uh reach out to lexington to find out if there's some reason if they can explain why um they took that vote and, and why they're looking to, to dissolve EDCO. Um, uh, um, because, uh, you know, unfortunately we, we, we don't have the time to wait for that because the board vote is June 4th. Um, doesn't seem to me, I mean, I don't know all of the personalities on the Lexington board, but it doesn't seem to me that they're a board that takes rash action. So um, a little bit surprised, um, but I will try to get more information. Mr. Hayner. We can go around in the circle. Uh, the only thing I can speak to is uh, my, the positive experience I've had. I've been the representative of this committee for several years on the school committee roundtable. Uh, this year it was a little slack because membership changed, uh, but uh, in the past it's been very informative, um, sharing information. Uh, I think the big key thing was a couple of years ago uh, I shared our norms and several members were very appreciative of what we have achieved as a committee. So I will be supporting uh, continuing our relationship with it. Dr. Alice Nampi? Um, yeah, I was a little confused about how we jump to disillusion. Is it required, if, a, if districts want to leave, they can just leave. I mean, they, they have a process, but they can just leave. They don't have to dissolve it. That's, that's separate, correct? Um, that is correct. And in fact, in the last decade, two different districts, we had 18 for a while, have left to be part of other collaboratives just because of where some of their special ed students were going. But uh, yes, they could just simply withdraw. And there's a process laid out in the articles for that. Um, and Lexington's uh, decision, which was sort of out of the blue, really, um, uh, has, has had some committees wondering whether they should withdraw just to, to protect themselves financially. Um, but the reason given that by the superintendent at this last board meeting was the, um, I, I think the lack of faith in Lexington or the financial viability of the organization. Um, and, you know, using this year as an example of the fact that we, we ended in a, in a deficit at the end of the year. Um, I think there was also a little bit of concern about um, so, some of the teachers in the program when we went into school closure, went down to a 0.4 FTE, but all of the services were covered. In fact, um, the teachers in the EDCO special education programs on average were providing about 25 hours of one-on-one direct contact, instruction and contact with students a week. So the, the students themselves were not impacted by that. It was a, it was a, a but anyway, th those were the reasons that were given um, to the rest of the board. And um, so uh, a vote is scheduled by the board on June 4th um, to whether we're going to vote as, you know, to support that, Okay, um, my 
two other things. One, when you initially spoke, you said 600 million, and I just want to six, point oh, out. Oh, 6 million. Six, yeah, six six million. Just in case million. anyone else heard the first one and not the second. Um, and second is, um, if districts withdraw, is the remaining numbers going to provide critical mass for all the things ENCO does? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, uh, right now, the the budget this year was 12 million. As we go into FY21, it's going to be a little under 10 million, 9.7. 9 Member assessments account for $186,000 of the revenue. I meant student-wise. If are there going to be enough students to have the programs or, or whatever is going? Well, well that, that we, the process of termination takes a year. So even if you begin it now, you can't dissolve until June 21, the end of June. I think one of the, the effects of, of even this discussion that's been going on the last few, the last couple of weeks is that will that prevent um, districts from referring students to the educational programs. I will say that what I've learned from the executive director that so far they haven't seen that effect, but if the board does vote for termination, I imagine that that would definitely have that effect. And so there, then what would happen is without the revenue from the tuitions into next year, the cost to all of the districts and anybody who withdraws or is still subject to these costs, are going to increase. They may, I don't know if they'll exactly increase because they're, you have to figure in, you know, the potential layoffs as well that could happen. It's a, uh, but yes, will it have an impact on the programming? Absolutely. I'm not sure I made my question clear. I was trying to ask, first, I'm supporting that we, that ECHO continues and that we stay in it. Um, I just wanted to ensure that there would still be adequate numbers coming into the programs to to justify their existence. Um, the projections, which are very conservative, um, yes, the numbers coming into the programming would um, justify it. But but Edco is a, a more complex organization. It does have uh, strong revenue from special education, but it also has grants that it, it manages, for example, the migrant workers grant that they've had for decades in, in providing um, support and education to migrant children. Uh, that grant um, is, it will end next December and so that would have an effect for sure. So there are grants that, um, that, the, that EDCO could lose should we move in this direction. But the actual assessments that a district would pay would, would have very little effect on its viability. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Ms. Seuss, you're just joining us now, but we're talking about EDGO, um, and uh, maybe you might want to wait until uh, we go around to have, to have your questions, if you have any. Okay, uh, Mr. Thielman? Well, um, I don't, I think Edco, you know, in all my years on the school committee, there was an issue with Edco maybe a decade ago, Kathy referred to this, that uh, wasn't good. And so I think we're, um, I mean, I think that the Edco's done us a great service and I think we've gotten a lot out of it. I think it's a good benefit for our town. I am curious to know what is going on in Lexington and what their school committee did and why they did it. And so Len, I think we should find that out. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you can share something, or maybe a, if there's a communication you get from the Lexington School Committee chair, you can forward to the committee. It would be good to know. I'm just cur I'm just curious to know, but I support us staying in Edco, and I don't see any other alternative. Okay, uh, Mr. Schuckman. Yeah, thank you. I first of all, with regard to Lexington, I think that if they're going to take that kind of a vote to withdraw and attempt to dissolve Edco. They owe it to the other member communities to communicate that to the other school committees who are looking this over. They, they've essentially thrown a rock in the pond. And I don't think our position that is that uh, we should throw a rock in the canoe at the same time. Um, 
this is an awfully rash statement. If they want to leave Edco, I mean, fine. That, that, that's their decision. Uh, but for us to look at it, I, I can't see any thoughtful, rational, data-informed reason for us to want to leave Edco or do anything to dissolve it. So I totally support the superintendent in voting no on uh, withdrawing and voting no on uh, on dissolution. Great, thank you, um, Ms. Morgan. All right, so Mr. Shipman, could you actually make a motion to that effect that we support the superintendent? Fine, uh, I move that we, uh, the Arlington School Committee supports the superintendent in maintaining our membership in EDCO and to not dissolve the collaborative. Second. Is there any further discussion? I'll just look for signs. Okay. Roll call vote, Mr. Hayner? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Ms. Seuss, do you want to vote or abstain? I'm going to abstain. Great. Mr. Tillman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Shookman? Yes. And I'm also yes. You forgot me. Oh, sorry, Ms. Morgan. Yeah. Sorry about that. And I'm also yes. So. Uh, I'm sorry. And who seconded again? I didn't hear. Mr. Hainer seconded. Ms. Seuss uh, abstained, and everybody else is yes. Yep. Yep. I got that. Great. All right. Yeah. Moving on. Uh, monthly financial report, Mr. Mason. Good evening. Uh, uh, once again, you have your, the, the reports in front of you tonight are, um, are the financial reports as of the end of April, uh, which is our 10th month of the fiscal year. And um, the reports you normally get is the general fund report, which is a report by object code, which is the expense types. Um, and, uh, and to note for the general fund report, uh, for this period, we, we are projecting a balance of, of currently of $833,524. Uh, um, and this doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna end at this, this figure. That we're still, I know, believe it or not, at this time of the year, working through a lot of different uh, options as we're trying to prepare for next year, um, do a lot of projects as the schools are closed. Um, and so some of the, the, some of the other costs that we're looking at for preparation has been uh, related to COVID-19. Um, uh, we, we, we're, we're purchasing probably close to $800,000 worth of different type of expenditures this year, uh, which, which, which also came up earlier concerning the meeting, which was tied to devices that are, are aging or that are not working to expectations of, for teachers and other uh, faculty members in the district um, that we're estimating to do a large purchase of about over $500,000 worth of technology um, that the town will probably uh, receive some sort of reimbursement at, a, in a, in a, in, at some future time in the future that the school committee uh, or the school district will not necessarily see. We also have, uh, purchased uh, a lot of things in preparation such as uh, Disin uh, disinfectants, disinfect, um, hand sanitizing wipes. We, we placed a large order right before school closed that is shown as a encumbrance here because it hasn't been paid out yet, but it was about $16,000 worth of orders for a district uh, for hand sanitizers and, uh, um, and hand sanitizing wipes. We've also looked, looked at purchasing thermometers um, contactless thermometers. Uh, we've ordered about 10 for isolation rooms that we that will probably be needed for each school uh, next year and as well as another 50 for access points. Uh, in addition, there is some holds for looking at um, uh, thermal cameras at uh, main access points of each schools. Um, and as we try to work out, you know, what may be needed as, as well as we purchase, um, we're looking at uh, purchasing or it's in these figures, oximeters uh, to measure blood oxygen levels. Uh, it's, it's believed that that's also another way of determining if an uh, individual has uh, uh, COVID-19 
um, because some people may carry it but not show a temperature. So uh, the, the nursing department thinks that this is important that we include. Um, as well as we're looking at uh, a safety issue when school reopens at the Audison School, they've been having issues with their PA system. So uh, we've been quoting that project out and that's well over $30,000 to complete that. Uh, as well as in order to better financially set us up for next year, um, we were looking at this year doing some prepayments of special ed education tuition with the approval of, of course of the school committee. Uh, that will come uh, out. We will be presenting you those figures uh, at a future meeting uh, before the end of the year to allow us to do that um, with this year's current budget, which will also give us some buffer. The report also uh, reports on grant the, the grant accounts, and uh, we did have. You'll see that there's been some there's some highlights in on the report uh, where there have been increases. Title. Title I, Title II, IDEA, uh, 240, and 262 have all seen some increases. And as well in this report is the revolving accounts report. Um, what you do not see in a revolving accounts report at this moment, uh, which I noticed is that we did not uh, show the, some of the transfers that we're going to propose. So uh, we're going to be transferring uh, some expenditures uh, from revolving accounts to also give us ability in the out years as, as COVID-19 may affect our revenues um, to have the ability to uh, be able to spend out of those funds if needed. Um, so th those projections are sh actually showing in the general fund report of, the, of that I initially discussed, which I didn't, I forgot to touch upon, but they are expenses that will be moved off the revolving accounts. Uh, that's my report for this evening. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, let's go around. Mr. Hainer. Sorry, yes. Do you have any questions? I'm, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. No problem. Dr. Allison Ampey? No, we heard about most of this at budget. That's Thank right. you. Uh, Ms. Seuss? Anything? Same. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thielman? No questions. Uh, Mr. Schlickman? Thank you for the report. Ms. Morgan? All right, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mason. I uh, just wanted to note that our second June meeting is very late, so any actions that you might want us to take might be better at the first June meeting. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to Dr. Bodie for the superintendent's report. Uh, well, we also didn't get through some of the um, other things earlier. If you want me to go back and talk about some, I can do a couple things. I'll try to make this short. I have a, I have a few things. But first, um, I want to uh, welcome our new Gibbs principal who will be beginning uh, July 1, uh, Mademoiselle um, Fabienne Pierre Maxwell. Uh, she she comes to Arlington with a lot of administrative experience. Um, in fact, she had uh, 13 years of a combination of a principal for eight years and five years system principal. She, um, we had a very positive feedback from all, all the stakeholders as we went through this process. But I also want to acknowledge um, how fortunate we were to have really such four strong candidates. It was a very a difficult decision, I have to say, and two of them were um, sitting administrators in the district who um, I have a great deal of respect for. So it, it, that, that made it very challenging because I also know the quality of their work and, and uh, what they do. But uh, we've, I've, I actually had a conversation with again today, pretty much every, week, every day this week in terms of starting to plan a little bit in terms of the transition. And she uh, will be coming to Arlington uh, sometime this month and Kristen DeFrancisco, who will be leaving as assistant principal, uh, superintendent in Groton Dunstable, will be working very closely with her for transition. And when, uh, probably at a, some, a meeting in early fall, we'll have her come and uh, meet the committee as well as um, our, our new principal for the peer school Andrew Omadi. Um, we did not finish 
just a couple of things. I, I, I would want to leave the meeting without just mentioning that we have been doing a lot of planning around summer programming. One of the questions that we received both at the parent and the um, both parent meetings, the secondary and elementary, were questions around summer school. Uh, what are we? What would we be able to do um, to support students through the summer? And uh, of course, a lot of questions around the fall. Uh, what I will broad ideas here is that we are going to still have ESY, which is a uh, special education program at all levels, uh, supporting uh, students who would have some regression over the summer. That program is still going forward. It's going to be, however, in virtual mode. And that all that planning is going on right now for that program. We are also going to continue our Title I program, which we had the last couple of years. And that program will also be virtual. Um, we, can, we can perhaps talk, um, and what we're, what we're doing at, from a broad point of view is we're looking at what are some of the things we can do for all students over the summer, uh, K through 12, in terms of opportunities for their learning. Um, and we are particularly also looking at what additional interventions we might be able to do over the summer for the students who, before closure, already had in their schedule uh, some form of intervention, whether it's reading services or math intervention. So we're looking at this in different, in, from different points of view at the high school, the middle school, and the elementary. And uh, what the plan is that we, are, we still have a few details to work out. Most of it has to do around software uh, because for, I'll just give you one example. One of the things for all students in elementary level, um, we are going to purchase uh, an extension of Dreambox, which has had a lot of positive feedback, both from teachers and parents, for K through six. And so that will be available, in fact, not only through the summer, but it's gonna be available all next year as well. And, and that's a, a, a tool that we can also, we gain a lot of um, feedback in terms of uh, concepts and skills. So that's an example, but a letter, I will present a, a full program of what we're doing at the next board meeting, but even maybe before that, we will be sending information out to parents in the district so they are aware of what the opportunities are going to be. And by the way, since we had discussion about EDCO, one of the things that is an offer, and we would have a bit of a discount in Arlington, if any parent would like to have a, a virtual course. They have something like 175 courses that they have uh, contracted with a major um, educational company, Ingenuity. And there's uh, courses at all levels, K-12, that, that uh, a parent can sign up for uh, through and, and receive the Arlington discount. So um, the other issue we, you mentioned it was about the, um, the parent meetings. Rather than go into all the different themes, uh, one of the things that we were actually working on this afternoon is finalizing the answers to all of the questions. When we had the elementary parent meeting last week, we had um, a, a close to 475 participants. And we had 100 questions going into the meeting in which we had divided them by themes and different principals answered the questions. Um, but even during the course of the meeting, we got another 100 plus questions, which we have been uh, working on creating answers. That whole document is going to go on to the website. A link to that will be sent out to parents so they know that it's there. Um, and that is will be happening very, very soon. So I don't know, before I go on to other I want to talk about graduation and just a couple other things. Does anybody want to ask any questions? So I'll look around at faces to see any. Okay, Dr. Allison Ampe and Mr. Schickman next. Um, can you speak to kindergarten? I'm hearing questions from parents about when are assessments going to be done? When should they be expecting information? Um, you know, any kindergarten related stuff? Yes, well, I was going to come uh, down my, my, my list here. Uh, I can tell you where we are with uh, kindergarten numbers. And um, we have 
we have 427 that are completed applications and we have another 52 that are in process to completion. Um, so for a total of 479 at, at the end of May. So I don't know what will happen over the summer. It could be that the last month or two people have not been focused on um, registration. We've also had a, close to 50 other students, I believe, um, at different grade levels as well, um, register um, over the last um, month or two. So normally we have, well I shouldn't say normally, we have had screenings the last couple of years that, are, um, that have been at the end of the school year or, or, or sometime during June that we discussed it in the district and we decided that the best thing to do is to wait till the fall and uh, do this do the kindergarten screenings and we used to do them in the fall and we just we decided a couple years ago that let's move them to june so we have more information early on and i have to tell you there was some debate about that at the time because for kids for children that age a couple months makes a big difference but having said that that's the plan of we also need to create an opportunity for kindergarten parents to um, have a sort of a virtual meeting as well, uh, just to understand. Uh, and we, we haven't decided whether to do that all district or we're gonna do it by, by school, but that, that planning is in the works. Now, one of the things that is repeating itself this year with the kindergarten numbers is where the increases are. And I've been sort of waiting the last few weeks to see if it's actually looking this way, but it is. It is looking that we may um, need three kindergartens at Pierce yet again another year. So that is going to mean that we're going to need another teacher at Pierce because that, that group of three just keeps rolling through the school. Uh, the, the same issue could be at, at uh, at Stratton. Um, we're waiting on that a little bit, but it's possible um, with the number of incomplete applications that we could also be pushing at Stratton toward needing four kindergartens. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see on that. But going back to the budget presentation for FY21, we're going to have to probably have uh, need some of those reserve positions in order to make sure that we don't have classes of, you know, 28, 29 kids in our elementary schools. So that's where we are. Um, I think that we were a little bit higher than this at this point, but I, but I haven't um, double checked the files to, to know that. Our own projections have us, uh, based on our uh, weighted formula at about 530, I think, um, Mike Mason has done the projections on that. Am I correct on that number, Mr. Mason? It's in that vicinity, about 530. So we'll wait and see. Repeat that to, number, I'm sorry. For the, the to the projections for kindergarten for this year uh, uh, in our modeling, I think it was about 530, wasn't it? Something yeah, like it, was about, it was around the 500 figure. I wouldn't yeah. say 520, 525. So as I'm looking at these numbers, you know, they're, um, our, we could stop right here. You know, we're certainly going to welcome every student that comes to Arlington. I, I, I really truly mean that. But we do have, um, we're watching all of these numbers very carefully. One in particular is Bishop because of just the space there. So by the next meeting, I'll have a little bit more of a report. And as we, we go forward, um, we'll, we'll see where this is. But I think that the numbers at this point are, are going to be such that we're going to have to at least with peers move forward with a, another teacher. Dr. Allison did you have anything else? Okay. Uh, Ms. Seuss? Uh, Mr. Thielman? No questions. Mr. Schuckman? Yeah, back in the earlier presentation, Dr. Bode, you mentioned some other alternative platforms as opposed to Google Classroom. And uh, I'd just like it if you'd uh, forward us uh, links and information about them. Sure. Um, it's called Seesaw. A lot of districts are using it 
for the K-2. We originally thought that it wasn't on the consortium. The Alliance is approved list, but it is. And we've actually already done quite a bit of professional development for teachers on that. And it's being linked into Google Classroom, but you know, we're, yes, but anyway, Seesaw, and I will get you some links uh, so that you can see it. Yeah, it'd be helpful for us to know what uh, you're considering using next year. Well, here's again one of the advantages of EDCO. So when we're looking at some of these things that you, you just pick up the phone or, or do, you know, an email out to your colleagues and say, what are you using? And of course, they're doing the same thing with us. So um, we know that in a lot of the EDCO districts in the, in the younger grades, they're finding Seesaw to be a little bit more um, child accessible. Because we want to, if we're in any kind of remote environment, we want kids to have some independence um, in the, the tool they use. Yeah, I, I don't, I, uh, all I want to know is have background knowledge of what it is so that yeah. if we yep. we'll send that on to you. I've had, had a chance to look at it. Sure, absolutely. Ms. Uh, Morgan? I can also give a report on the Arlington High School progress. Um, yeah, we didn't, fin it. sorry, we didn't finish going around yet. Ms. Morgan, oh. did you have anything? No? Okay, my, my only comment is in the unlikely event that the commissioner comes out next week with guidelines that says we can have an in, in-person ESY, I think we should have a conversation uh, either at uh, curriculum CIAA or uh, here at the board about, about how we're gonna approach that. Ms. Elmer? Yeah, um, actually that is the guidance from the DESE currently is to plan for vote with having backup plans to shift to uh, in-person that become you know, allowable under the phase reopening, and can you meet your local um, health board requirements in addition to whatever guidance this comes out? So that's actually what we're planning to do. Essentially, is begin with remote while having a backup plan to be able to shift at some point in the summer if that becomes an option. Uh, right now, obviously, they don't have any detail on that option okay great that that's a good that's an important clarification as opposed to it will be so, solely remote which is what dr Bodie said so thank you for that and any you know of course any communication that goes to the parents will would have that qualification in it we'll have the call we're, we will have a full um explanation of what will be going out in the way of summer programming for parents and you of course will get a copy of that as well because certainly things like occupational therapy and physical therapy and even speech therapy are extremely difficult to do remotely. And any any in-person startup of that, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, behind a, a, a glass partition, um, you know, would definitely be helpful if that's Yeah, allowed. it's going to be a balance of what state and local requirements are. So yeah. if the state phases in, Arlington obviously is going to have their own requirements that you have to meet around you know, actually offering that. So that's, yep. and if we're able to meet that shift. Yeah, great. There was a call with the commissioner yesterday and um, there was no mention of the possibility at this point, but I think everybody's waiting to see where. Um, right, we just wouldn't, shouldn't foreclose it unless it's foreclosed. Thank you. Exactly, exactly so. So I'm glad okay. you asked that question to get that clarification out there. Um, I normally give a report on Arlington High School. Um, the, there hasn't really been much that has changed. The only thing that has happened over the last, since the last meeting has been a, a subcommittee meeting on exterior and landscaping. And basically the discussion was all about height offenses, um, design offenses, plantings, irrigation. Uh, so it was a, it was a very, um, uh, uh, all of, all of that will be brought forward to the building committee, which meets next week also. So it's moving forward. If you've gone, you, I'm sure you've all gone by, by the high school, so you can see that uh, the work is uh, the work is going on. Uh, the last thing is talking about graduation, and you know I I, I want to congratulate um, all of our seniors. I think that universally. Uh, staff at the high school and all the teachers in the district as well as administration feel very badly that uh, all of the traditional activities that 
seniors get to experience are not going to be as they have been. So um, the high school has worked with a team, a group of people to develop uh, graduation plans. They have surveyed students. Students actually served on the committee as well. And survey students is what they, what they really wanted um, in the way of the commemoration of the graduation. So basically the high school graduation in a very simple way is uh, it's a sort of three parts. They actually have already done, well, almost done. It's going to go to the 30th of May. They've been having small groups come together with the parents and uh, caps and gowns. All the caps and gowns were, uh, they, have, they have them. And taking pictures, formal pictures of them receiving a diploma with their, with their family. All of the plans that are around graduation have been vetted with the Board of Health. So I want to thank the Board of Health. They've also been vetted with the police department, the fire department, and have um, been very supportive of um, trying to make this special for seniors. There is going to be an ACMI has also been helping uh, to create a streaming ceremony and all of the graduation speakers. Thank you, Ms. Morgan, for doing yours the, uh, the other day. Uh, have been have already had their um, their speech filmed, videoed, and they're going to put it together into a, a virtual ceremony. Then one of the things that seniors really wanted was to be able to see their teachers, and so there's going to be a a caravan on the Sunday after graduation, the seventh, in which um, the caravan will go through. They have a route that's been worked out with the police department. Uh, for all the seniors, which if they were all showed up in their cars, would be about 1.3 miles worth of cars. Uh, we'll, we'll move uh, through, through a des designated uh, pathway. And so they have an opportunity to see the teachers, the teachers can cheer them on. Uh, and it, it's, it's not a, would like to say it could be a big community event, but the police department does, and, and, and Board of Health both are in total agreement that we really uh, want to discourage that because not that we don't want people to cheer them on, it's just the issue of congregating at this time. So I want to thank the high school. They really have been very thoughtful about this. And, um, and particularly, there's a couple people I want to acknowledge. Joanna Began, who has just been a, a, a just a wonderful in terms of all the organizing of this. Lori uh, Pescatori, who has been the last blast committee she's been very helpful in this and and i know last blast is thinking of some kind of event later maybe later in the summer we'll see where seniors can have an in-person uh, celebration and then kevin whitmore from acmi and as i said the christine bonjour the board of health police department julie flaherty uh kevin kelly for helping and supporting this plan thank you and that's it Great, thank you. Was there anything else about um, remote learning that we didn't get back to? Were you, were you talking about a survey, additional survey of parents? Yes, we're going to do another survey of parents. Uh, we're, we have uh, a survey for students that we're going to send out on Monday uh, for students in grades six to eight to try to, to understand their experience and what kinds of things that they have encountered and how that might help us going forward. We certainly want to have a survey of parents. So looking at the week of June 8th on that. And um, we also would like obviously to, to survey our staff um, and understand their experience. So all of that will be very Great. helpful. Great, Ms. Seuss? Oh, uh, just two questions. You said surveying students six through eight. Do you mean six through 12 or is it separate? I say six, thank you for saying that. Six through 12, yes, sorry. It's, not, it's the middle in the high school. They are the ones that have an email address. Um, I know there's been some discussion, uh, even among members, about whether we should uh, a lot, activate the email accounts for our students at K through five, but um, there, there's been a lot of discussion about it, but our, our view on it still is that that's not a wise idea to do. And then also just to encourage you that you should please use the school committee is a resource to look over any questions. Um, you know, I know you have 
a bunch of administrator team looking at it and I'm sure they're helpful, but we might also be able to catch things that might be overlooked otherwise. Okay, we'll take you up on it for um, when we do the parent one. We, it's, it, the one to the student has gone through many eyes at this point, many revisions, um, but I think it's just about ready to go. Sorry, Dr. Allison Hampi, go ahead. Um, also on the remote learning survey stuff, um, going back to Ms. Morgan's concern that there may be people who are going to opt to homeschool in the fall, I think it'd be really helpful as you put out the survey, um, both in the email in which it's in and maybe any other emails that you're sending out about it, that you're letting people, letting parents know that school is a work in progress, that you're work you know that part of the reason that we're collecting this information is to improve school for now and for next year and um i think that people will feel better about it if they feel like it's going to be getting if, if school is going to be improving that's all okay thank you anything else all right on to the consent agenda. All items listed are considered to be routine or will be enacted in one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 20283, total warrant amount 394676.75, dated 5-19-2020, and approval of these school committee organizational meeting to be held on June 11th, 2020 at 6.15 p.m. Can I get a motion? So move. A second? Second. All right. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Dr. Ellison Ampey? Yes. Ms. Seuss? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I also vote yes. All right, subcommittee liaison reports. Budget? We met again to discuss the budget and you've already heard what we discussed in the reports. Uh, community relations. Uh, yeah, we met to uh, interview some candidates for the po um, Poet Laureate Committee and then met again today to finalize our selection. Um, I, I'm not sure we, we can, we have not heard back from the person who we're, we want to recommend. Do we want to do a motion now or, or do that later? Um, I don't care either way. I don't think we have the person's resume, but. Right, it, we, we just finalized it today and that's why. Yeah, why don't we just hold it till the next meeting? Okay, great, I won't be part. <laughs> uh, right, uh, CIA, oh, CIA, anything? Nothing. Facilities? Uh, I had a, had a parent contact me about uh, basketball court at Brackett, uh, damage, testing on the facilities, and they said they would uh, look into it. Okay, policies and procedures? No report. Nothing. All right. Search. Process committee, we already heard about. Anything else? I'll just say anything else. Any other committees? All right. So. I guess we had, we had the election modernization committee. We heard right. updates about the election mostly. All right. And we do not have executive session tonight. Could um, I just make one quick announcement, please? Sure. Uh, I would like to commend to uh, the superintendent, uh, the faculty and students at Audison. They usually uh, invite veterans to a program every year. They weren't able to do it this year. They were able to put uh, some videos from past things together and kids uh, participated, did a wonderful thing. And I passed it on to several veterans. And I, as a veteran, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Great. And uh, I did want to recognize Jennifer Seuss for, again, for her uh, six years of service, six years and two months of service on the committee. Uh, we already gave you your chair back on our very last time together uh, and uh, want to thank you again for all of your hard work, particularly 
your work in making sure our, our community is represented on the board and uh, through actions, uh, through surveys and, and focus groups and other uh, open meetings uh, and to make sure that community input is considered uh, in, a, in, the, in our major decisions. It's really a, 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 a quite an a accomplishment to have that sort of built into our processes now and uh, we will do our best to keep it up uh, as we leave. So thank you once again. Thank you. Um, so someone asked me uh, who was going to be doing the school updates as I'm leaving and I said it was a personal effort so <laughs> if you want to take it on you're welcome to do it. I might update about other things in town but um, anyway you're welcome to do it. <laughs> All right. If I'm Mr. Sukran, Mr. yes. Yeah, I, 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 I've just been so thrilled to have uh, Jennifer as a colleague. She's been the heart and soul of a lot of great things that have happened, particularly those issues surrounding uh, community engagement. And she was steadfast in all the hard work of engaging the community in the solutions we had to come up with for meeting our enrollment crunch, uh, particularly the Gibbs opening. It's been an honor to serve with her. She's been a great member, and I really, really, really appreciate you as a colleague. You've made this a better committee. I, Mr. Hayden. Okay. Uh, Jennifer and I have not always got along, uh, but we, our disagreements have always been professional, courteous, and uh, over the past four or five, uh, past two or three months, I've really uh, learned to appreciate her, and I will miss your voice. Thank you. So you all gave speeches last time, so you don't need to give a speech. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anybody else? I'd like to just, uh, I think Jennifer and I have always gotten along. So, uh, <laughs> uh, listen, I want to thank Jennifer. I mean, really, seriously, our level of engagement with the community has increased uh, significantly during uh, Jennifer's six years on the committee. I've, I've uh, enjoyed getting to know her, enjoyed her friendship and her wisdom about all things in Arlington and beyond. And uh, her updates, her school updates about once a month or so or whenever they come out are very helpful. And uh, people often quote Jennifer Seuss to me um, in the town when uh, we talk about the school. So uh, we will miss Jennifer. Um, it's a big loss for this committee. Uh, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch outside of school committee in the future. May I say something, Mr. Carter? Sure, sure. Yes, I, will, sure, sure. I also want to thank uh, Jennifer. She's been uh, terrific to work with, and uh, certainly the some of the committees that we have been working on this year together, the calendar committee, uh, I would wonder whether she would be willing to continue on that as a community member. Um, certainly, uh, we've, there's been a lot of work and more work that needs to be done um, as we go forward. But anyway, thank you. I agree with Mr. Thielman that the engagement, and not only the committee with the community, but you know, bringing um, issues to the school administration around uh, how best to reach out has it, been very helpful. I appreciate that. All right. So I did, I did skip over announcements, future agenda items, liaison reports. Anything else from anybody before we conclude? Dr. Elson Ampey. Don't we need to send in our organization survey of who's going to do what next year? I'll send an email about that tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, so I think Karen already asked for the people willing to serve as officers. So that part has been done, right, Karen? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so it's just the committee preferences. Sub, sorry, subcommittee in assignments. Yep. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. All right. Roll call, Mr. Hayner. Yes. Dr. Allison Nampy. Yes. Your last vote, Ms. Seuss. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I also vote yes. Thank you all. Been vivid as always. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>